in Iraq. That's live at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now a hearing looks into allegations of corruption in the Iraqi government. Among the witnesses, Comptroller General David Walker and Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction Stuart Bowen. This is about four hours. The committee will come to order. Today's uh, hearing is one of the most important that we will have this year. President Bush has made Iraq our nation's top foreign policy priority. We all know that has meant extraordinary sacrifices from our troops and their families. Over 3,800 of our soldiers have been required to make the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq, and another 28,000 have been wounded. And we have already spent over $450 billion on the war, with hundreds of billions more still to come. The Iraq War is the number one issue in all of our congressional districts and the issue that we have spent the most time debating here in Congress. Most of our attention has been focused on military questions. Is the surge working? Can we reduce the number of troops? Should we set a redeployment date? These are all important questions, but they aren't the only ones that matter. As General Petraeus has observed, there is no military solution to a problem like Iraq. Political reconciliation is the key to achieving lasting peace in Iraq, and one of the keys to political reconciliation is combating corruption. That's why we're holding today's hearing. An honest assessment of corruption in Iraq will provide insight into whether political progress is possible. We're very fortunate that David Walker, the Controller General of the General Accountability Office, and Stuart Bowen, the Special, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, will share their expertise with us this morning. And I want to give special thanks to Judge Radi Hamza al Radi for agreeing to testify. Judge Radi was the Commissioner of Iraq's Commission on Public Integrity. He was appointed this, to this post by Ambassador Bremer, and his job was to identify and prosecute corruption in Iraq. Judge Radi knows too well the horrors of life under Saddam Hussein. He was one of Saddam's torture victims, and he never hesitated when our government asked him to take the dangerous job of leading the fight against corruption in Iraq. Christopher Griffith, the senior advisor to the U.S. Office of Accountability and Transparency, told our committee that Judge Roddy is, quote, the most honest government of Iraq official that I have met in my 21 months in this country, end quote. Another senior embassy official told us that Judge Roddy has a reputation as courageous, honest, and effective. From everything I can tell, Judge Roddy did exactly what we asked the Iraqis to do. He stood up for freedom, he stood for democracy, and he stood up for honest government. And now he finds himself without a country. Judge Roddy is under attack by the Maliki government, and he and his family are the targets of serious and persistent death threats. 31 of Judge Roddy's employees and 12 of their family members have been assassinated. He can't return to Iraq, and he is seeking asylum in the United States. Judge Roddy will tell us there is an epidemic of corruption in Iraq. While he served as the head of the Commission on Public Integrity, he opened 3,000 corruption cases. He found extensive corruption throughout the government, especially in the ministries of defense, interior, and oil. In all, his efforts identified $18 billion, a staggering sum, lost to corruption. Judge Roddy will tell us that corruption is undermining political reconciliation, turning ordinary Iraqis against the government, 
and fueling the insurgency. The Maliki government is our ally in Iraq, but we need to ask, is the Maliki government too corrupt to succeed? And if the Maliki government is corrupt, we need to ask whether we could, in good conscience, continue to sacrifice our blood and tax dollars to prop up his regime. These are important questions, but they are questions that Secretary Rice and the State Department do not want us to raise. For the, for last, uh, for the last several weeks, the committee staff has been interviewing the State Department officials in charge of anti-corruption efforts in Iraq. What we have learned is that these efforts appear to be in a complete state of disarray. The committee's investigation has revealed that anti-corruption efforts are dysfunctional, underfunded, and a low priority. The officials we interviewed told us on the record that the State Department has no coordinated strategy for fighting corruption. At key meetings of the embassy's anti-corruption working group, up. One official told us, I would like to be able to say that we've done quite a bit in this area, but unfortunately, we have not. Another official, Judge Arthur Brennan, the former director of the Office of Accountability and Transparency at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, said, quote, I think Ambassador Crocker was serious about going forward on this, but I don't think everybody is serious about it. And if they are serious about it, then somebody else should, should uh, have been doing their job. Incredibly, Secretary Rice directed these officials not to answer any questions about the extent of corruption in Iraq and its effect on political reconcilia reconciliation and the insurgency. Her position is that all information that reflects poorly on the Maliki government is classified. At one point, my staff asked an official whether he agreed with a public statement of Secretary Rice praising the anti-corruption efforts of the Iraqi Interior Ministry. The official told us, and this is a U.S. official, I cannot discuss this in an open forum. The State Department even retroactively classified memos about corruption in Iraq after the committee requested them. These efforts to silence debate are an absolute embarrassment. My staff prepared a memorandum that summarizes both what these officials told us about the state of U.S. anti-corruption efforts and what they could not tell us about the state of corruption in Iraq. And without objection, I'll make this memorandum part of today's hearing record. Sometimes this committee breaks down along party lines during hearings, and I hope that won't be the case today. Whether one supports or opposes the President's policy, we can't ignore the reality of corruption in Iraq, and we can't ignore the reality that corruption is undermining the political progress our troops are fighting and dying for. If we're going to invest more lives and billions more dollars in Iraq, we need to know whether there is the political will in Iraq to succeed. That's why today's hearing is so essential. I want to recognize um, a ranking member, Tom Davis, for his opening statement. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's the sovereign responsibility of every democratic government to root out and prosecute official corruption. Sustaining the trust and confidence of the governed requires proactive, visible programs to deter and punish those who had plundered the public resources for private gain. We need to be vigilant about fighting corruption here at home, as the Chairman often reminds us. And we should help emerging democracies build their capacity to combat for pervasive, deep-rooted malfeasance. So this hearing offers an important and timely opportunity to assess U.S. government efforts to nurture anti-corruption capabilities in the fledging government of Iraq. But I have some concerns about the majority's stated intention to investigate the status of Iraqi corruption and the functioning of Iraqi government ministries. Good government and small-D Democrats in Iraq don't need to be lectured by this committee on the extent of corruption in their country. They need our help in building the structures, policies, and processes to fight it. And we can't afford to be naive or wear cultural binders when looking at ways to address a long-standing, long deeply ingrained problem. We didn't bring corruption to Iraq, and it won't stop when we leave. Saddam Hussein's looting of the United Nations Oil for Food program was emblematic 
of the leaky economic systems and corrupt habits the current government inherited. Coalition Provision Authority Order 55, establishing the Iraqi Commission on Public Integrity, acknowledged the battle against corruption is a long-term struggle that requires lasting commitment to change behavior at all levels of government. Today, despite creation of national enforcement systems in Iraq and U.S. Embassy programs to mentor inspectors and judges, it seems that commitment has yet to materialize, either in their government or ours. According to the same CPA order, anti-corruption programs in Iraq had long been viewed as arbitrary and intermittent. Apparently, they still are. The former head of Iraq's main anti-corruption investigatory body, Judge Roddy, joins us this morning to describe the many challenges he faced trying to investigate corruption claims in a society splintered by sectarian violence and political score settling. Our efforts so far don't appear to have helped much. A very cogent embassy consolidated anti-corruption strategy was put together but just a year ago. It looks good on paper, but like other capacity building programs in Iraq, our anti-corruption assistance has suffered from missed deadlines, shifting priorities, structural instability, and lack of strong leadership. In fact, evidence of that organizational disarray triggered this hearing. A draft statistical report commissioned by the U.S. Embassy Office of Accountability and Transparency on Corruption Investigations by Iraqi Agency was embellished with hearsay and anecdotes about block cases and official favoritism. Before being vetted or finalized, it was leaked to the media. The State Department then turned light comedy into high farce by classifying the report, which was already on the Internet because it said things everyone had already heard about lax anti-corruption enforcement in Iraq. But there are serious questions we need to address today. What should we do to help the Iraqis fight corruption, mindful that they are a sovereign nation? What can we do, given the current security environment? And what will we do to implement an effective strategy to help the Iraqis help themselves? The answers matter, not just to accountants and lawyers, but to all Iraqis and every American there. Funds stolen from the people of Iraq sap the growth of civil society and fuel lawlessness and violence. Finally, there is no avoiding the unmistakable subtext of this hearing, the premise that a corrupt Iraqi government doesn't merit further American sacrifice or life uh, or treasure. By that measure, some would have the United States cede our sovereignty to groups like Transparency International and disavow anyone too far down their annual list of corrupt states. But that is far too narrow a view uh, of how the most powerful nation on earth determines who to befriend and where to pursue our interests. As one political veteran observed, having discovered an illness, it is not terribly useful to prescribe death as a cure. We can help the Iraqis treat the disease of official corruption without killing their chance to stand as an independent sovereign nation. Let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, for agreeing to our request to invite uh, Ms. Claudia Rosette to testify. We uh, are disappointed that she is not on the first panel and we have to go to a third panel to hear her. All our witnesses today bring important information to this discussion and their unique perspectives will add depth and context to our oversight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. For our first panel, we have Judge Roddy Hamza al Roddy, Mr. former Mr. head Mr. of the Iraqi Commission on Public Mr. Integrity. Chairman. Yes. Point of order. Uh, I would ask a regular order so that members be allowed to uh, uh, present opening statements. I did have one, if I could be allowed. Well, I'm sorry. The rules do not require that members give opening statements. The, the practices of this committee under uh, Chairman uh, Burton and Davis was not to give the right to all members to offer, offer opening statements. So we'll proceed under the rules. We have Judge Roddy Hamza al Roddy, former head of the Iraqi Commission on Public Integrity, Mr. David Walker, Controller General of the United States, and Mr. Stuart Bowen, Special Inspector General for Iraq Construction. We are pleased to welcome all of you to our committee today. Uh, our, the practice of this committee is to take all testimony under oath. So if you would please rise and raise your hand, I would like to administer the oath to you. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. The record uh, will uh, reflect the fact that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Chairman, could we have the translator identified for the record, please? Yes. Could the translator identify herself? Nina K. Behrens, State Department interpreter. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I would like to suggest that when we get to questions, because we do have a translator, that each member be given seven minutes because it will take time for translation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I got to just insist on regular order. We, we had asked that our witness be put on the first panel, which would have expedited and I think allowed for that. But since we are not going to get to our witness until the third panel, uh, we want to move things along. Okay, then uh, we won't have. We'll go to five-minute uh, intervals, and uh, we did accommodate the minority of their request for the witness, but evidently not exactly where they would like to have her. Um, we'd like to hear from each of you. I'll start uh, with uh, General Walker, if we might. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Mr. Davis, pleasure to be back before the House Government Reform Committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the GAO report that we issued today on U.S. efforts to build the capacity of Iraqi ministries. It is my understanding it has been provided to this committee. The development of competent and loyal government ministries in Iraq is critical to stabilizing that country. Iraq's 34 ministries are responsible for ensuring security through the armed forces and police and providing essential government services such as electricity, water and health care. The ministries are Iraq's largest employer with an estimated 2.2 million government workers. U.S. efforts to build the capacity of Iraqi ministries include programs to advise and help Iraq, Iraqi government employees to develop the skills to plan programs, execute budgets, and deliver, deliver effective services. In 2005 and 2006, the United States provided $169 million for programs to help build the capacity of key civilian and security ministries. The administration received an additional $140 million in fiscal 2007 and requested $255 million for fiscal 2008. In doing this report, we traveled to the region, including Baghdad, interviewed officials from U.S. government and other international organizations, uh, and uh, uh, collected other information that was available uh, for us to review. In summary, we found the following. U.S. efforts to help build the capacity of uh, the Iraqi national government have been characterized by, first, multiple U.S. agencies leading efforts without overarching direction from a lead agency or a strategic plan that integrates these various efforts. And secondly, shifting time frames and priorities in, responses in response to varying and sometimes deteriorating conditions in Iraq. U.S. efforts to develop Iraqi ministerial capacity face four key challenges that pose risk to their success and long-term sustainability. These include significant shortages of Iraqi ministry employees with the necessary skills and knowledge to conduct key tasks, sectarian influence over the militia infiltration of some ministries, corruption within the ministries, and poor security conditions that endanger employees and cause skilled workers to leave the country. The U.S. Government is beginning to develop an overall strategy for ministerial capacity development, although agencies have been implementing separate programs since 2003. GAO's work in this area shows that an, the overall strategy for capacity devel development should include, first, a clear purpose, scope and methodology, secondly, a delineation of U.S. roles and responsibilities in coordination with other donors, including the United Nations, third, clear goals and objectives linked to Iraqi priorities and fourth, performance measures and milestones, and last, fifthly, the cost, resources needed, and assessment of program risk. Individual U.S. capacity development efforts have included some but not all of these components. All are necessary for sustainable success. We therefore have recommended to the State Department that it, in conjunction with the Iraqi government, complete an overall strategic and integrated strategy for U.S. capacity development efforts. Congress, we believe, should also consider conditioning future appropriations on the completion of such a strategy. Two other things, Mr. Chairman. First, we at GAO are attempting to lead by example uh, in providing capacity building assistance to our counterpart organization, the Board of Supreme Audit in Iraq. I have met with my counterpart uh, on more than one occasion, both in Iraq and in the United States. We are providing a lot of technical support. Uh, and training, and we are also encouraging other countries in the region uh, to be able to provide support to the Board of Supreme Audit as well. I am pleased that progress has been made there. Uh, secondly, I think it is also important to recognize that while it is unrealistic to expect that the United States is going to have more allies provide troops 
in Iraq, that it is very important and appropriate that our allies do more to try to help with regard to this capacity building effort, especially with regard to civilian ministries, because there is significant expertise available among our allies and among international organizations, and hopefully that will be forthcoming in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Walker. Mr. Bowen, let's hear from you next. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today on the important subject of this hearing, the state of Iraqi corruption. This past August, I visited Iraq for the 17th time since my appointment three and a half years ago as the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. While in Baghdad, I met with key coalition and Iraqi officials on the subject of corruption within the government of Iraq. SIGR has regularly reported on this issue over the course of our 14 quarterly reports, and we conducted two audits uh, on the subject of U.S. support for Iraqi corruption, and in a word, found that that support has been disappointing. Corruption within Iraq's government is a significant and serious problem. It's an Iraqi problem, which the government of Iraq has recognized. A recent report submitted by Iraq, pursuant to the requirements of the recently enacted International Compact for Iraq, identified, quote, high levels of corruption and an immature accountability framework within the government of Iraq. So it's something that the Iraqi government, on the record, recently has recognized. As the ranking member pointed out, we did not bring corruption to Iraq, and it will not be gone whenever we leave. But it's an issue that fundamentally can undermine our efforts to build a democracy, a fledgling democracy. Since mid-2003, Iraq has struggled against a violent insurgency. Corruption has concomitantly afflicted the Iraqi government, exerting a corrosive force upon its growing democracy. SIGR has described that force as a second insurgency. Prime Minister Maliki recently echoed that sentiment when he referred to the struggle against corruption as, quote, the second war in Iraq, unquote. And Deputy Prime Minister Baram Saleh told my office that corruption, quote, threatens the state, unquote. So there is a recognition, but is there a response? And that's the subject, I think, of an important aspect of this hearing what response is forthcoming both within the U.S. program and within the Iraqi government. Within the Iraqi government, there are three key entities uh, who have charge of fighting this second insurgency. The Board of Supreme Audit has been around since 1927. and It is the analog to the Government Accountability Office, and its focus is on the audit of Iraqi ministries. The Commission on Public Integrity and the Iraqi Inspector General System was created uh, in 2004 by the Coalition Provisional Authority. Uh, the Judge Roddy, uh, who, is, who was the commissioner until recently of the CPI, is someone who, with whom I have met on every trip I have made to Iraq, virtually every trip. And his office and my office work very closely on our investigations and exchange information uh, as relevant. Uh, his office, uh, along with the 29 IGs and the Board of Supreme Audit, comprise 4,000 officials assigned to fight corruption. But the tide of corruption continues to arise, rise, and the problem is as bad today as it's ever been. Although they may have deterred some crime and there have been some prosecutions. Uh, over the past year, the number of corruption cases under investigation by the CPI has increased by 70 percent. Uh, similarly, individual Iraqi ministries have reported dramatic increases in corruption cases. Uh, there are three significant challenges confronting the the effort of Iraqi ministries, these Iraqi corruption fighting entities, to fight corruption within their ministries. Security, politicization of the rule of law, and capacity. Security uh, afflicts and inhibits everything that, that uh, Iraq tries to accomplish in recovering from the attack. The, the first president of the Board of Supreme Audit was murdered two and a half years ago. Judge uh, President Abdel Basit succeeded him. But his office itself has also been under direct attack. This, this last May, Ministry of Interior Guards uh, came and, and, and uh, had a standoff with uh, President Bossett's uh, security guards. It, it, it resulted in a peaceful resolution, but, but that's the kind of intimidation that's going on in Iraq. At least 31 employees of the CPI have been killed, and judges and judicial investigators are also subject to threat. 
This last trip I met with the, a chief judge of a district in Iraq, and he complained to me that his investigators are not permitted to carry weapons. And thus, his judges and the judges across Baghdad are subject to continual threat and attack, for that matter. The politicization of the rule of law is reflected in, in uh, provisions like Article 136B of the Iraqi Criminal Code, which permits any minister to exempt any employee accused of corruption from prosecution uh, for that crime. And, and also, that same provision pr protects any member of the military and any member of the police force. Uh, that, that sort of provision is incompatible with the, a growing democracy. Uh, exacerbating that legal provision is the directive from the Prime Minister's office issued this spring that required Judge Roddy with the Commission on Public Integrity to seek permission from the Prime Minister's office before instituting any investigation of any minister or former minister. U.S. Uh, assistance to the anti-corruption effort in Iraq amounts to around $65 million, as our audit last year pointed out. Uh, less than one half of one percent of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. This is a disappointing investment, but more important, notwithstanding the funds invested, the, the planning is, uh, has been weak. And, and that is what the core finding of, of our audit of last July pointed out. We had 12 recommendations. Uh, out of that uh, audit, the Office of Accountability and Transparency was formed. Uh, there has been some progress. A, an advisor to the IGs was appointed. An advisor to the Board of Supreme Audit was appointed. Those are good steps, but more needs to be done. Uh, uh, most of those recommendations stand open, uh, and we continue to work and hope to work with the CPI under its new leadership, with the Inspectors General, and with the Board of Supreme Audit. I will meet with each of them in November when I return to Iraq. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for this time to address you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowen. Judge O'Reilly? There's a button on the base of your microphone. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the U.S. Congress. I would like to read my statement to you in English so you can hear it directly from me. I am Judge Radi, Hamza Radi, Commissioner of the Commission on Public Integrity, CPI, Republic of Iraq. I have the honor to be here among you today to di discuss with you the most important problems facing Iraq after the elimination of the dictator Saddam Hussein. I want to thank the American people who have given their lives and money in order to achieve noble goals in Iraq, so uh, in Iraq, such as ending the severing and separating uh, democracy. Thank you thousands of times. In my written testimony, uh, I highlighted the reasons for an Iraqi Commission on Public Integrity my appointment as commissioner and my background and discusses much of our work. Our work has been not worthy, but I must report that corruption in Iraq today is rampant across the government, costing tens of billions of dollars and has affected uh, virtually every ag agency and ministry, including some of most powerful officials in Iraq. Corruption has stopped possible advances by the government on the political level, on economic reconstruction, on basic services, amenities, and infrastructure, and on the rule of, of law. Corruption has cont contri contributed to the, uh, fella to the failure of the government 
of Iraqi to control the militias that control parts of the government, in fact. Corruption has helped fund sectarian militias and violence even from those in the Iraqi military and police who are supposed to maintain order and protect the Iraqi people. Unfortunately, today in Iraq, corruption has infected our biggest source of money. Oil corruption has also infected those who have the guns to restore law and order, and the leadership who promise a new, better Iraq. I have lead my life governed by these few words. Law is above all, no one is above the law. This guiding principle should apply to all government departments and ministries uh, neutrally, fully, and without regard to sect, ethnic, or party affiliation, tribe, or religion. That is how we have tried to operate the Commission on Public Integrity in Iraq. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, gently we have been met with a great problems first and foremost is the violence and personal attacks direct on us. Since the establishment of the Commission on Public Integrity, 31 employees uh, have been killed, as well as at least 12 family members in, in a number of cases. My staff and their relatives have been kidnapped or de uh, detained and tortured prior to being killed. Many of these people were gunned down at close rank. This includes my staff member, Mohanad Abit Salaf, who was gunned down with his seven-month pregnant wife. In one case of a target, death and torture, the security chief on my staff was threatened with death many times. His father was recently kidnapped and killed because of his son's work at CPI. His body was found hung on a meat hook. One of my staff members who performed clerk duties was protected by my security staff, but his 80-year-old father was kidnapped because his son worked at CPI. When his dead body was found, a power a drill had been used to drill his body with holes. Walid Kashmula was the head of CPI's Mosul branches office. In, in March 2005, a suicide bomber met with Walid in his office. Wearing a suicide vest, he greeted Walid and the set off his vest, killing Walid. More which, this was a target killing of CPI leadership. These are just a few examples. There are many more which were di directed to my staff. Me and our families personally for example, my family's home has been attacked by rockets. I have had a, sn a sniper bullet uh, striking near me as I was 
outside my office. We have learned the hard way that the corrupt will stop at nothing. They are so corrupt that they will attack their accusers and their families with guns and meat hooks, as well as counter charges of corruption. I and my, of my people, and many of my people have been to, so attacked, so to have others who have tried to stop their corruption. It is a sick method when the person fighting corruption is falsely accused of corruption. Justice loses and corruption wins. The prime minister and his government have refused to recognize the commissions and the judiciary independence under the law to investigate corruption in a non-sectarian and non-political political manner. Further, the government did not appoint leaders, particularly ministries and inspector generals that would fight corruption within ministries. In order to promote sectarian agendas, professional technocrats who were qualified to perform vital government services and administrations were not appointed. Worse, the government has formally blocked actions against the presidency, the council of ministers, and former and current ministries. Use the executive law to allow ministers and the uh, prime minister to stop specific corruption cases against their own corrupt employees and official and has promoted sectarian agendas over the rule of law. Importantly, it has been impossible for the Commission on Public Integrity to safely and, and adequately investigate oil corruption where Sunnah and Shia militias had control of the metering, transport, and distribution of Iraq oil. This has resulted in the Ministry of Oil effectively financing terrorism through these uh, militias. And my small group of investigators investigated the largest number of cases in the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior, as you might imagine, investigating the security forces of Iraq is very difficult but necessary for an Iraqi future of transparency and the rule of law. Thank you for your attention and pensions and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Judge Roddy. I'm going to start off the questions and then we'll follow the regular order. Well, I want to thank all three of our witnesses for your presentation in this panel. And I, uh, I think it's uh, very important for us to understand that corruption is a problem in Iraq. And it's not a problem that we can think is only unique to their culture and we should dismiss it, but it's undermining our very mission in Iraq. It's keeping the possibility of a political reconciliation from taking place, which is the only way we're going to end this war in Iraq successfully. Judge Roddy, I want to especially thank you for coming here today. It's not easy to come to speak before a foreign country's representatives in a foreign language. And I appreciate your taking the time to read your statement in, uh, 
in English, but I know that in response to questions, you will want to answer us uh, in Arabic and have it translated. It's very courageous for you to be here. You've already told us that your life and the life of your family members have been threatened, and you can't take that uh, casually when you've already seen 31 people that work for you already killed for the uh, anti-corruption efforts that your commission has undertaken. You've undertaken this effort at the United States' request. Ambassador Bremer asked you to take on this responsibility. Uh, the United States understood from the very beginning that um, it was essential to uh, stop corruption in order to have Iraq succeed as a stable and independent country. Let me ask you this question. You've been there for a number of years in this position as head of the Commission on Public Integrity. Based on your experience over the last three years, is corruption in Iraq getting better or worse? Yes, it is uh, getting worse because of the sectarianism in the country and the lack of the rule of law in the country. You indicated in your statement that $18 billion is a sum that you feel uh, uh, has uh, gone to the costs of corruption. $18 billion is a lot of money. It could have gone to electricity projects, hospitals, police training, or a lot of things that could have helped the Iraqi people. How much cor does corruption affect the reconstruction efforts in Iraq? I believe that it has stopped the process of reconstruction in Iraq. And uh, you've indicated that it, some of the money has gone to the sectarian militias. How would that have happened? In areas where oil is present, such as Baji, and it is a Sunni-controlled area, and Basra, which is a Shiite-controlled area, the militias uh, do uh, control these areas, and they sell oil and take the revenues of oil to finance the purchase of weapons to their militias, respective militias. I would think that the Iraqi government would want you to investigate money that uh, would go from the sale of its oil. After all, this is, the, this is a uh, revenue for the government of billions of dollars, and yet you are not allowed to investigate corruption relating to the sale of oil. Um, why would the national government stop you from stopping the corruption of oil sales, which then go to the militias that are fighting the government? Because these militias are from their parties, from their uh, blocks, and therefore this is a financial re a source or financial revenue for them, and that's why they forbid us from investigating such cases. Mm. In addition, that those who manage or direct these directorates are from their own uh, political affiliations. So it's your statement to us that around $18 billion, maybe more, has been used for corruption instead of for proper purposes like reconstruction, hospitals, electricity, and fighting against terrorism in Iraq. Is that, is that your statement? 
Um, so I'll have so Can we repeat the question, Mr. Is, Chairman? Is it your view that $18 billion is not being used for uh, hospitals, reconstruction, uh, electricity, and to even fight terrorism because it's being siphoned off by corruption? It's going to corruption. سرفت هذه المبالغ طيلها ثلاث سنوات إلا أنك لم عندما تأتي إلى الأرض لا تجد أي أي إعادة إعمار سوى اثنين إلى خمسة بالمئة فقط. All these, all these uh, amounts were spent over the uh, three uh, years, but when you go to the field or you go to the ground, you don't see signs of reconstruction. You only see 2% to 5% of reconstruction happening. When you go to the field and you don't find water, nor electricity, nor fuel, and Iraq is the country of oil, then uh, Iraq is uh, uh, importing oil now, so you don't see reconstruction. Okay. Thank you. Um, General Walker, you feel so intense about this corruption issue that you've even recommended to us that we should l limit our money to Iraq requiring them before they get the money to stop the corruption. Is that uh, your view? Slightly different, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the United States has been trying to help uh, fight corruption and, and build capacity in the Iraqi ministry since 2003, but we haven't had a strategic and integrated plan. We haven't had appropriate met metrics and milestones. We haven't had appropriate responsibility and accountability noted, and therefore we believe that the Congress should consider conditioning future appropriations for this effort mm -hmm. to making sure that that plan is done and effectively implemented so that uh, we can achieve some results uh, rather than just uh, have more efforts. Thank you. And Mr. Bowen, you, do you agree from your observations in Iraq that uh, corruption is increasing rather than decreasing in Iraq? That, that's what I said. And, and I'm, the rising tide is in part attributable to the politicization of, of the rule of law, uh, specifically uh, the directive from the Prime Minister's office requiring permission to be obtained before initiating prosecutions of any minister or former minister and, and the like. The, uh, one, one distinction I want to draw here, though, is, is that, that Judge Roddy is talking about his oversight of Iraqi money and, yes. and the, the 18 billion in Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund is taxpayer money that's not within his jurisdiction, within mine. And, uh, and as... No, as I understood his statement, he thought over a three-year period there's been a, a, a waste of 18 billion right, of Iraqi Right. I just want to be sure that there's 18 billion. It's the same number as the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. And I want to draw, number. yeah, I want to draw okay. the distinction between yes. the two so there's not confusion uh, as, as has occurred in the past, that, that on the U.S. side, corruption has not been a significant component to date that we've uncovered. Well, then, if I asked how high up in the Iraqi government this corruption goes, uh, Judge Roddy, does it go all the way to the Prime Minister? Do you think that uh, Prime Minister Maliki is involved in corruption himself? Uh, as a judge, I cannot say that someone is uh, engaged in something unless I have evidence and proof. However, uh, that uh, Maliki has protected some of his relatives that were involved in corruption uh, uh, endeavors, and especially uh, some of his relatives. Yeah. And he's allowed other ministers to protect their employees from any investigation. نعم ولذلك أغلق الوزراء ورئيس الوزراء قضايا ب مليار دينار عراقي وهي بالنسبة العراق ليست قليلة. Yes, and for that reason, the uh, Council of Ministers has, uh, the, the uh, Prime Minister has closed cases related to 100 billion Iraqi dinars, and in Iraqi currency, such an amount is not a, a small amount. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit opening statements. For the Without record. objection, that will be the order. Um, Mr. Walker, the GAO report released today discusses corruption in Iraq and uh, references to a State Department embassy report from December of 2006. That's correct. Can you, can you tell us anything about this 2006 report, which is now classified? Um, what I can tell you is that the 2006 report, based upon publicly available information, noted serious concerns with regard to the uh, nature and extent of corruption uh, in Iraq. Um, also noted uh, that there had been significant diversion of oil and fuel, um, both that both fuel and oil that is produced within Iraq as well as uh, that is purchased from outside Iraq uh, and then uh, stolen and sold on external markets. Uh, so the bottom line is, is that uh, the State Department report uh, noted that the U.S. is trying hard to try to build capacity, including to try to fight corruption, but corruption is a serious problem uh, involving uh, large sums of money. Um, do you know what data was used to prepare the report? I don't have that available to me, Mr. Davis, but I'm happy to try to find out yeah. for you. Would it surprise you to learn that during our committee interviews, staff, we, we learned that this report, quote, was started as a statistical analysis and then the drafters said, let's go interview the CPI investigators and get their subjective reactions of what it's like in the various ministries and that some of the conclusions were, you know, it was pulled out of the air so it's not statistically based. Uh, that discussion about particular cases were added by the sole drafter for flavor. It is not the practice of GAO to reply upon reports embellished for flavor, is it? No, not at all. And, and I might note for the record, we were not asked nor did we assess the methodology that the uh, State Department used in preparing that report. According to the State Department, this report was a working draft and is not a formal embassy report and that neither this report nor the follow-up in July 2007 was vetted by any uh, senior staff uh, at the Embassy. And uh, so let me um, just ask this. Corruption in Iraq is not a new phenomenon. Do you agree, and let me start with Judge El Rani, do you agree that Iraq has a culture of corruption going back many years? Yes. And do you think that corruption is pervasive throughout the Middle East? Yes. Yes, okay. Mr. Bowen, would you s agree with that? Uh, I would say that Iraq has a history of corruption. Absolutely. That, that characterized Saddam's regime. Yeah. And, all right. Let me, um, during my time here, yield uh, to uh, Mr. Issa to. Uh, Thank you. Judge, I, uh, I commend you for your diligence at, at great personal risk. Uh, I think that. Uh, Ranking Member Davis said it very well that uh, we are not surprised that uh, a country that was run by a corrupt dictator uh, who doled out monies uh, in order to maintain power would have a uh, pattern of corruption. How much of the corruption, in your opinion, do you believe comes from that legacy of Saddam uh, and how corruption was part of the structure of maintaining authority and power? corruption سواء كان في حكومة صدام أو الحكومة الحالية فهو سيء وهو يقضي على بلدي يقضي على بلدي Corruption is corruption, whether it was under Saddam's regime or under the current government. Corruption is bad and it is undermining my country. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call your attention to a letter, but while it's being brought up, I want to ask uh, are you aware that there are about 750,000 Iraqi refugees in Jordan at this time? Yes. And uh, probably another 500,000 or more in uh, Syria. Is that your understanding? Yes, sure. And to your understanding, in both of those countries, in general, are Iraqis safe when they're living there? 
هل تعتقدون ان العراقيون هنالك في هذه البلدين يشعرون بالامن واذ يعيشون فيهما؟ يعني طبعا افضل من القتل اليومي اللي يصير من بلدنا. It is better than the daily killing that takes place in their original country. I appreciate that. Well, I want to call your letter, uh, your attention, Judge, to a letter written on September 20th to uh, 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 the U.S. Citizen <coughs> Citizenship and Immigration Service concerning uh, your family and their welfare, naming some nine members of your family. Are, have you seen this letter before? طبعا هذا شيء خاص وانا ما احب يعني اتكلم به وخاصه انا عائلتي بظروف خاصه. Yes, this is a private matter and I do not wish to talk about it, especially that my family is uh, subject to private circumstances. No, I certainly understand uh, that, but it, in order to, to understand the workings of this committee, I think it's important that we ask just some very limited questions and we're not going to uh, name any names other than to note that the letter is signed by uh, Chairman Waxman, Chairman Lantos, Chairman Conyers, and Chairman Thompson, Benny Thompson, uh, the chairmen of Homeland Security, House Judiciary, House uh, Government Oversight and Reform, and the Foreign Affairs Committee. Gentlemen's time has expired. Is there a question that's pending? Yes, very, very briefly. Uh, when, do we, when were you first involved in the request for this letter to ask that your, your family, your, extent, your entire family be brought to the United States uh, as a refugee? And particularly, was, so that, I'm gonna, was uh, that prior to or after you came here under a diplomatic visa? أنا جئت إلى أمريكا بالاتفاق مع وزارة العدل الأمريكية بسفرة تدريب لي 12 من موظفيه. I came to the United States under the auspices of the U.S. Department of Justice on a workshop, on a training workshop, workshop along with 10 of my employees. ورئيس الوزراء حتى يتخلص مني حتى لا أعود البلد طرح موضوع إحالتي إلى المحاكم أو اتهامي حتى لا أرجع إلى البلد And the Prime Minister to get rid of me so I don't return to my country has put forth this issue, this issue of prosecuting me and prosecuting me Gentlemen Please, if you have more to say. I love my family, I love my country, I love to serve my country, however these threats has uh, been an obstacle for me. Thank you very much. Mr. Cummings? First of all, I want to thank you, uh, all the witnesses, but you, Judge Roddy, thank you very much for your bravery and your integrity. Um, can you tell us about the threats that you and your family have faced? Briefly. I said briefly. <laughs> بعد أن أحلت كثير من الكتل السياسية الحالية على المحاكم نتيجة الفساد قاموا أول مرة بإحالتي على مجلس النواب بتهم زائفة حتى يسحب الثقة After I um, referred several After I referred several cases pertaining to some of the political blocks uh, uh, governing there to the um, uh, courts um, in corruption cases, they referred me to the parliament, charged me with this issue, and uh, I would say that I was successful in uh, combating uh, corruption there. Uh, 
يحصلون على سحب الثقة من البرلمان. And they were unable to uh, remove uh, confidence in me in front of the parliament. بعدين اتهموني بالمحكمة بنفس التهم وأيضا المحكمة لم يستطيعوا الحصول على قرار منها. And they also accused me in courts with the same charges. And again, in courts, they were unable to successfully get uh, uh, something against me. Judge Rady, let me ask you this. Um, in addition to what I said in my testimony, in my deposition. Judge Rady, who is Salam al Maliki? Maliki? Was he the former Iraq Minister of Transportation? السابق وهو قريب لرئيس الوزراء وقد أحنه على المحكمة إلا أن رئيس الوزراء لفساده إلا أن رئيس الوزراء غلق قد غلق هذه He is, yes, he is the former Iraqi Minister of Transportation. He is a relative of the Prime Minister. We had referred this uh, person to the courts for corruption. However, the Prime Minister has resorted to closing this case. And he, uh, did you get a, you got a letter with that in regard to that, did, did you not? And I'm going to show you a document on the screen. And what does this letter tell you to do in regards to the investigation of Prime Minister Maliki's cousin, Mr. Salam? Not to follow up on the case and not to investigate, and there was a request to close the case. Knowing that Salam had violated the constitution and the uh, prime minister had accepted, had approved that. And why do you think that, did, did he ever uh, uh, grant you permission to reopen the case? Was he ever granted permission to reopen the case? No, we have attempted to move the case forward, but the Prime Minister had closed it. And why do you think he closed it? Firstly, because Salam al-Maliki uh, is affiliated with one of the uh, parties of the uh, Shiite uh, alliance or coalition. And secondly, because this gentleman is one of his relatives. Mr. Walker, when Judge R uh, uh, Roddy uh, testified a little bit earlier, he basically said he didn't even have the power to audit the oil revenues. Is that correct? In other words, he has the power, but he doesn't get the opportunity to do so. Well, but my understanding is, is that the judge's responsibility is not to conduct audits. It may be to conduct investigations. Mm -hmm. Audits typically are done by the Board of Supreme Audit, which is our counterpart organization. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Abdul Bassett is president of that organization. Are you able to do it? You said uh, it comes under you. Well, we, we cannot audit Iraqi funds. We can only get involved where it involves U.S. funds. And obviously, the Special, in in the special Inspector General for Iraq has been set up to try to be able to uh, have an on-the-ground presence in Iraq to do certain types of activities. But we do do audit work in, in Iraq, but it's on U.S. funds, not Iraqi funds. Very well. Thank you. Uh, you know, I might note that, as I said before, Mr. Cummings, we have worked very closely, meaning GAO, with our counterpart organization in Iraq. And corruption is rampant in Iraq. It's a serious problem. It has been for a while, continues to be a problem. Uh, it's, uh, y we have a situation, as, as was mentioned by Stuart Bowen, that while there hasn't been massive corruption that he's found with regard to U.S. activities in Iraq, there's huge waste there. And I might also note that security is a real concern. When I went to visit my counterpart in 2006, we couldn't meet where we were supposed to meet because a U.S. bomb-sniffing dog found a bomb in the area that we were supposed to meet. 
and the U.S. also, U.S. Army, went into the home of my counterpart in November of 2006 and took the, took the weapons of his security guards without any explanation. And so I, and I've been trying to get an explanation for that for him. Uh, so there's a, uh, you know, there's a real challenging situation uh, that exists in that country. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Cummings. Your time has expired. Mr. Micah. Thank you. Uh, we didn't get a chance for opening statements, but I just wanted to uh, put on the record a couple of uh, uh, comments. Uh, first of all, about the conduct uh, not only of today's uh, hearing, but uh, the conduct of yesterday's hearing. Um, and uh, I didn't get a chance yesterday uh, when I uh, moved to adjourn the, um, the meeting. It was based on requests by the Department of Justice and also uh, the Department of State to uh, ask us not to not hold a hearing, but to, uh, to delay a hearing. And uh, it brought to mind um, my request to Mr. Uh, Davis. Uh, this is during the Sandy Berger, uh, when we, Sandy Berger incident, when we found out that he had taken uh, uh, classified documents, uh, stuffed them in his trousers or whatever, and just actually destroyed them. And I requested Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis may recall this, uh, that we undertake an investigation. Department of Justice asked us not to do that, and he, he did not to do that. Then we came back and I asked him during the sentencing time uh, to conduct an invest, uh, investigation and, and hearing in this committee. And uh, you might recall, Mr. Davis, that you also denied that because of the Department of Justice request. So that's a difference in the, con, uh, in the way this committee operated with Mr. Davis and, and uh, the current uh, chair. Additionally, um, I've been on the committee for 15 years. I've never received, my staff gave me this, they said the majority memo for today's hearing given to the minority was received nine minutes before the hearing. Uh, I don't mind uh, participating. In fact, I enjoy participating in this. Uh, I think this is one of the most important responsibilities in Congress. But to have the minority receive uh, this, ni this, this memo uh, and, and our information about the hearing, nine minutes, in, in my knowledge, is unprecedented, let alone to isolate our witness at the end. I, uh, I, I just have never seen anything uh, like the conduct of that. Uh, Mr. Walker, uh, corruption is a problem not only in Iraq, but in uh, just about every democratic uh, society and throughout the third world. Is that correct? Corruption is a problem in much of the world, in some places a lot more yeah. than others. And I, I asked the staff, uh, uh, well, of course, I, I'm in the Congress, the United States Congress, one of the, the most uh, respected institutions in the world. Right now we have probably more members of Congress under scrutiny, c uh, criminal investigation than any other body, uh, probably more in prison. Then I said uh, corruption. Uh, I said, what about some of the past administrations? And I've got sort of the record from the Clinton administration. Uh, we have uh, the record set. The only president ever impeached on grounds of personal malfeasance. The most number of convictions and pleas uh, guilty by friends and associates. The most number of cabinet officials to come under criminal investigation. The most number of witnesses to flee the country to refuse to testify. The most number of witnesses to die Suddenly, the first president sued for sexual harassment. The, uh, well, it, the list goes on and on of the last administration. Now, let me be fair. Forty government officials were indicted or convicted in the wake of Watergate. Another uh, number, um, 47 individuals in business association with the uh, Clinton uh, gov uh, administration were convicted or pleaded guilty to 30 to crimes with 33s occur occurring uh, during the Clinton administration itself. Now, this also talks about the Reagan administration. There's a, th a total of 31 Reagan, uh, admir Reagan era administration convictions. Uh, so uh, my point is that no administration is left uh, without corruption. Additionally, uh, I want to ask the, our, uh, the judge a question. Now. Uh, Mr. Clinton gave a pardon to a gentleman by the name of Mr. Rich. Mr. Rich was involved in an oil for uh, food scandal 
which I understand that money went to prop up the uh, Saddam Hussein regime. Are you aware of any of the oil for, uh, sco oil for food uh, scandal uh, incidents or Mr. Rich? Corruption is found all over the world. And I have heard about corruption in the uh, file of uh, oil for food program. Uh, in the oil for food program. Iraq is cooperating with the other countries to gather information about this issue. However, I believe that the issue is different in Iraq for many reasons. Firstly, the infrastructure in Iraq is almost uh, equal to zero. Services in the country are almost equal to zero. Iraq is a wealthy country. Imagine that the budget of 2007 is 41 billion dollars. And 30 billions are what remains from the previous and earlier years. Don't we think that 71 billion dollars, such an amount that can build an entire country, don't we think that it uh, deserves a follow-up and attention? Corruption is corruption in all times. And I am a professional and I fight corruption because this is my profession to do so. Thank you very much, Thank um, you. Judge Roddy. Sure. And uh, I just want to inform the gentleman, I don't want to make any comments, although I certainly would, I would like to make comments, but I won't make comments on his uh, round of questioning. But when we were requested by the Justice Department not to inquire with Blackwater's recent episode in September, we honored that uh, request. We have always honored requests from the Justice Department. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member for, for holding this hearing. Uh, I also want to uh, uh, thank uh, Comptroller General uh, Walker and also Inspector General Bowen for your great work on our behalf. Uh, and I also want to thank the judge. I appreciate the, the uh, risk to yourself, and, and uh, I offer the uh, prayers of our country for the 31 employees of your ministry that have been killed and, and also their families. Uh, judge Roddy, you, your testimony says that uh, your investigators identified about $18 billion uh, as the estimated cost of corruption, corruption in, in Iraq. I, there's so much to go on here. I, I've got to pick just one case so I can ask some questions about it. This is a case uh, involving Aham al Samarai. I uh, hope I have that right. And uh, he was uh, the head or, or very high in the electricity industry, the Ministry of Electricity, I guess it's called. Uh, I want to ask you do you recall the uh, facts surrounding Alham? Al Samari. Look, <laughs> Just, just briefly, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the facts on. You don't need a long explanation. Just basically tell me what he was in being investigated for. What were the allegations against uh, Mr. Al Samarai? 
تهم اجى من ديوان الرقابه الماليه من سبريم اوديت اجانا 11 نقطه مخالفه لسيد ايهاب. How about a leading question? How much money was Mr. Al Samarai accused of uh, embezzling, stealing? It is not embezzlement, it is a waste of public money. Okay. Uh, corruption involving how much money? Hundreds of millions? In, in each ministry, a particular, a certain amount of money, and the total across all ministries is $18 billion. Okay. Now, I understand for, that. For uh, electricity, $2 billion. $2 billion. Okay. Mr. Al Samara, I, I understand, was arrested and held in prison uh, inside the green zone, uh, but he somehow escaped. Do you know the facts surrounding that? Uh, I know some of the facts that surround this case, and I know that a uh, U.S. Uh, protection company has helped him uh, get away. Do you know what the name of that, uh, that U.S. protection agency might have been? I believe it's DynCorp. Okay, Blackwater. Uh, now, with the assistance of uh, Blackwater, uh, do you know where? This is Dyn he said DynCorp. Oh, DynCor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. DynCor. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Uh, okay. So DynCor, a U.S. contractor, helped this person get out of jail in in the green zone. Do you know where uh, Mr. Al Samara is right now? This is not important to me. What matters to me is there is a in absentia, in absentia right, uh, right. Uh, order or okay. uh, uh, court order against this man, and uh, that is a sentence for three years. It may not be important to you, but it's important to this committee. Is it your understanding that this gentleman is in Chicago, in the United States right now? المهم الآن حكم ثلاث سنوات على هروبه وهناك 11 قضية تنتظره وطلب الاستبدال بواسطة تربول. Three years a sentence awaiting him and there is eleven other charges against him fielded through the Interpol. All right, my understanding, and I'll offer for for a testimony that our staff did talk to this gentleman. He is in Chicago, and. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lynch. Let me uh, explain that on the House floor we have votes, and we've got a number of votes. So we are going to recess now for uh, around 40 minutes. I would request that members come back here as quickly as possible after the last vote so we can continue the questions. We thank you for your patience. We stand recessed.
meeting of the uh, committee will please come back to order. Uh, before Mr. Burton arrives, because he's uh, next, Mr. Lynch, you were asking a question and you were in the middle of your question. Do you want to complete your last question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just to, I, I'm going I'm to ask uh, Mr. Bowen, but I, I've tried to establish that the former Iraqi electricity minister was accused of corruption of potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, he was arrested. He was brought to the green zone. I believe it was a uh, DOD facility. We're talking the United States military. He was then broken out of that jail or removed from that jail by a U.S. contractor. We have evidence it was DynCor. Uh, testimony was DynCor. Uh, Mr. Bowen, is that your understanding of the facts of this case? Uh, yes, but with the one additional fact that he was convicted by that Iraqi court and was awaiting sentencing. Okay. May I? I is there a, is there an investigation ongoing relative to his uh, the handling of this case? I, I can't comment on our ongoing investigations. Okay. So if it's an ongoing investigation, it must be ongoing. Uh, can you can you tell me, uh, Mr. Bowen? And I look, I've. I've sort of followed your work uh, in Iraq, and I, I appreciate it greatly. You're doing, you're doing tremendous work, and I appreciate it. Uh, can you tell me, is the allegation that this gentleman is in Chicago, is that, is that correct? Is that your understanding? That, that is what I have uh, heard, yes. Okay, I'll let it go at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Mr. Burton, I think you're next. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me all right? Uh, was there any corruption under Saddam Hussein? Sure. Yes, sure. Oil was for Saddam's and for Saddam's family only. Were you ever a prosecutor when Saddam Hussein was in power? Saddam <laughs> Yes. How long were you a prosecutor when Saddam Hussein was in power? After I graduated from the Judicial Institute, he did not consider me as a member of the prosecution, but he dealt with me as a regular employee. You were not a prosecutor from 79 to 92? <laughs> It shouldn't be that difficult to answer. Either you were or you weren't. I graduated from the institute as a prosecutor. So you were a prosecutor from 79 to 92? Only the last three years. What did you do before that from 79 to 92? I was managing the funds of the um, juveniles or the orphans, those who are under 18 years old. You were a prosecutor, though, for three years under Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Uh, how, did you, how did you get appointed? How did you get appointed to these positions? How did he get appointed to these positions? There's a difference between an attorney. I have worked as an attorney until the change. 
but but you were a prosecutor for this for the government. In the court of misdemeanors, yes. How did you get that job? Yes, when I graduated from the Judicial uh, Institute, uh, they did not uh, appoint me but because I was a non-Ba'athist, but afterwards, because of my work managing the funds of the orphans, um, I uh, was appointed to that. And then in 92, because of great pressure, I, uh, I left. Well, the, the record shows that uh, you were in the Saddam Hussein regime from, 19, uh, from uh, 1979 to 1992, and that you were a public prosecutor, and that you did work under Saddam Hussein. Now, it was laudable that you worked for the children that were damaged during the Iran-Iraq War, but, uh, but you were, in fact, an official of Saddam Hussein, were you not? What was your last question, Mr. Burton? You were an official in the Saddam Hussein regime, and how did you get those jobs? I uh, obtained those jobs with my uh, hard work, my studying, and my work at the Judicial Institute. Well, let me just finish, Mr. Chairman, and I know you've given uh, others just a little bit extra time. Uh, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator who even cut people up and put them in uh, chippers. Uh, they've done, they did everything, buried hundreds of thousands of people in mass graves. And if you had been an opponent of Saddam Hussein, I cannot figure out how you got those jobs. Of course, under Saddam Hussein, I refused to do what he was asking, and therefore they uh, uh, put me in prison and they broke my uh, uh, head, the bones of my head. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Uh, under our rules, uh, I believe from my past experience that those who are advising, specifically providing testimonial input, are also supposed to be identified and sworn. Uh, could we at least have the identification of those who are obviously contributing considerably to the answer? Well, we did have the uh, translator identify. No, no, the uh, gentleman behind. Oh, the uh, attorney? Yes, uh, and the one next to it. They're obviously providing a significant I amount of these answers. I don't recall that that's the practice of the committee to ever ask. Uh, who's advising people, they're not testifying. Uh, Ms. Watson? Mr. Chairman, parliamentary yes, inquiry. Yes, um, thank you so Ms. much, uh, Mr. Inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Parliamentary um, inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Just a minute, Ms. Watson. Yes, you have a parliamentary inquiry? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is a fact, is it not, that when we were doing uh, uh, investigations under my leadership that we did identify the people behind those who were testifying? Uh, I understand that that was not the general practice. I know of no rule that requires it. If, if you want to find out, I don't have any reason why you shouldn't find out, but that hasn't been the way this committee's operated in the past. You have selected memory laws like the White House did. Uh, uh, resuming my time. No, you haven't started your time, but you will now. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, Judge Roddy, were you tortured under Saddam Hussein? Yes, I was tortured in 
Yes, I was tortured twice in 1970 and in 1977. Yes. Do you still bear the marks of that torture on your body? A break in my head skull is still uh, visible. Right. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, Judge Roddy, in your written testimony, you say that Prime Minister Maliki has refused to recognize the independence of the Public Integrity Commission. You also said that officials and agencies in the Iraqi government sent us formal letters forbidding us, and this is a quote, to take any action against the presidency, council of ministers, and former or current ministers. Is that right? This is right, and this is a letter that would demonstrate to you in front of yes. you that they prohibited us from conducting investigation touching the presidency, the Council of uh, Ministers, current and former ministers. Yes, that letter is up on the screen. The Thank press you. might want to uh, get a copy of it. And the document says that, and the, I'll read it because the wording is so small. It's been decided not to refer any of the following parties to the court until approval of His Excellency the Prime Minister has obtained a presidential office, Council of Ministers, current and previous ministers. This is a, a secret order from Prime Minister Maliki's office saying that you cannot investigate the Iraqi president, the prime minister, or any current or past Iraqi ministers without the prime minister's position. Is that right? And we have a, we have a copy of it here. Both in your language and in. And you're nodding that that's correct. Is this order allowed under the Iraqi Constitution? This is an illegal order, and the uh, Iraqi uh, that goes against the Constitution and the Constitution considers the CPI an uh, independent entity and that would only be subject to orders of the Parliament. Thank you. Uh, Judge, did you have any cases that you were investigating that were stopped by this order? Tens of cases were stopped because of uh, this letter would go to the courts and the courts would stop uh, looking into uh, examining the cases. Mm -hmm. And did you have cases that involved current and past ministers? Yes, current and uh, former ministers. I would say that uh, this letter, this secret letter, illustrates and demonstrates to me that uh, there are violations of your own constitution going on under this administration. That's true. And uh, to me, I interpret it as corruption. Yes. If this is a new developing democracy, we need to attack corruption wherever we find it, and that's the reason for this hearing today. I appreciate uh, your response, and maybe you want to translate that. Uh -huh. uh, I appreciate one of your responses to one of our members when you said corruption is corruption, and I am a professional, and I go after corruption wherever it may be. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Watson. Uh, we now turn to Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
thank you for holding this hearing, and I appreciate the bravery, particularly, of Judge Roddy. As members of Congress know, and hopefully the public knows, General Jones, the Marine Corps General, issued a bipartisan report just last month. It was called the Report of the Independent Commission on the Security Forces of Iraq. And of course, there are two missions we've been training the Iraqi folks for, military and police. I trust all the witnesses are familiar with this report because it says, quote, sectarianism and corruption are pervasive in the Ministry of Interior and cripple the Ministry's ability to accomplish its mission to provide internal security of Iraqi citizens. End of quote. Things are apparently so bad at the Interior Ministry that this report by General Jones, a Marine Corps general, recommends that the entire national police be disbanded. Here is exactly what the report concluded. Quote, conclusion, the national police have proven operationally ineffective. Sectarianism and its units undermine its ability to provide security. The force is not viable in its current form. The national police should be disbanded and reorganized. That is a pretty damning conclusion. Mr. Bowen is the Inspector General. What is your opinion? Have corruption and sectarianism really gotten to this point that the Jones recommendation is appropriate to scrap the national police and start all over? I am very familiar with that issue uh, and that report. And uh, indeed, I met with um, members of the Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq uh, that, that is in charge of training the national police. And they independently confirmed to me the problem of infiltration in the national police, as well as other problems in the, in the IPS and other uh, uh, Iraqi uh, security forces and the facility protection services as well. But the National Police is a very serious issue. It is managed uh, quite directly from the MOI and the, uh, the uh, corruption that grew within it, which is really a sectarian infiltration uh, that was condoned over an, uh, uh, several years, uh, has produced the situation that General Jones quite accurately addressed and, and his solution, uh, I think, is on point. Judge Roddy knows this situation better than any of us do. One of the most disturbing elements of this conclusion of the report was that the previous um, Minister of the Interior was a man, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, Bayan Jabir? Bayan Jabir. Bayan Jabir. And it was under his leadership that the ministry became so heavily politicized. The report, for example, says that Mr. Jabber gave key ministry posts to members of the Badr Brigade, and the Badr Brigade militia infiltrated Iraqi police units throughout Iraq. Judge Roddy, to your knowledge, was Mr. Jabber a member of the Badr organization? This uh, issue, of course, I know about it from the media because I do not have a political relationship with them. However, I can say that these security ministries are now divided among uh, the sectarianism and the sectarianism influence, and therefore you see that it, their performance is not uh, a good performance. Well, the amazing thing to me is it's my understanding, even though Mr. Jabber was the previous Minister of Interior, instead of being punished or reformed or in any way changed, now it's my understanding he's been promoted to be Minister of Finance, <laughs> which is truly astonishing. 
Judge Roddy, given Mr. Jobber's record at the Interior Ministry, do you have any concerns about what he is doing as Minister of Finance? My concern is towards the ministries the, uh, themselves because uh, the sectarian quotas are ongoing and therefore these ministries are not protecting the Iraqi people. And therefore you see that the security is continuously deteriorating. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cooper. You. Have you completed what you wanted to say? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Salmi? Are you not going to go at this time? Okay. Mr. Issa? Go ahead, Bill. And I yield my time to Mr. Issa. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the gentleman yields his time to me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, Mr. Bowen, Sayed Bowen. Has, the, uh, has the Iraqi government under at any time given us authority the United States executive branch or the Congress authority over corruption of, of the use of Iraqi funds? This coercion, have, coercion. Have, have we asked Iraq to allow us to investigate uh, the use of their funds? No. Okay, so we've never asked? No, sir. Have we ever asked any government if, whether we could investigate the corruption in their government? That, no, to your not knowledge. to my knowledge. Okay. Is it unusual for the U.S. Uh, Congress to investigate a sovereign nation's uh, utilization of their own resources, in your experience? Uh, this is the first time I have been at a hearing on that matter. Okay. Do you think it is appropriate, in your own judgment? I think addressing the, assessing the state of Iraqi corruption uh, is an appropriate topic for oversight and review because it, it amounts to an economic undermining of uh, this fledgling democracy. Corruption is the abuse of public office for private gain, and I, it has occurred on a large scale in Iraq. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, the, the qu question really isn't do we an analyze it. The question is what do we do about it after we all agree on this dais that it was rampant under yes. Saddam and it is rampant under Maliki and that, in fact, uh, it goes far, far, far down. It, do, it doesn't flow just to the top the way it once did, where it was you, you only stole with the permission of the top. You now you have little fiefdoms that are stealing all along. Uh, I guess uh, uh, has the, I guess one of my questions has the GAO ever investigated another sovereign nation's utilization of its resources? No, the only thing that would be close, as you recall, the coalition provisional authority was set up by the United States. The coalition provisional authority had access to both U.S. funds as well as Iraqi funds. Sure, and, and you uh, oversaw, or your organization oversaw how we spent their funds while we were in control. Actually, of not. What we did was we were involved in uh, expenditure of U.S. funds, and we facilitated the release of records. Uh, from the U.S. government to the, the Board of Supreme Audit of Iraq so that they could hopefully do the audit work with regard to Iraqi funds. So we have not audited Iraqi funds, but we facilitated the Board of Supreme Audit hopefully being able to do the same. Okay. Well, so that the record be complete on one thing, uh, I, don't, I, I know you are not going to find one person on the dais under any circumstances that is satisfied with the level of integrity, transparency, or a lack of corruption in Iraq. That's, that's, that's something that from the chairman going both directions on the dais, uh, it is very clear that this is not a government that works to the best interest of their people, uh, particularly if they are Sunnis in Anbar or Kurds in the north. Uh, Mr. Bowen, in your written testimony states that a number of, of corruption cases under investigation in, uh, by the Iraq Commission on Public Integrity was 1,861 in 2006 and 3,158 in 2007. Uh, can you describe essentially how we got to this increase? I mean, it, it looks good on paper. Tell me about it. Well, well there is uh, one is an increased effort under Judge Roddy's leadership to, uh, to push forward uh, 
push, try to push back the tide of corruption that has been rising as he's testified today. Uh, it's also am indicative of that rising tide itself that, that the uh, corruption efforts have increased, I mean, the, uh, because the, the work is to be done. But okay, as your, we've, as we've I appreciate also that. To, yes. to your knowledge, how many convictions have there been in Iraq? I don't know what the total number is. There have been hundreds of convictions. Okay, so there, they do get convictions, and yes. what is the typical penalty when convicted? I mean, are they the equivalent of a U.S. felony conviction? It, it, it depends on the nature of the crime, of course. Uh, the, the challenge in Iraq, especially with the ministries, is that there is selective prosecution because there is by fiat the authority with every minister to protect any ministry employee from any corruption investigation. And so the, I'm aware of some cases wherein most of the defendants were protected under Article 136B, but one of the lower level ones was permitted to be prosecuted and imprisoned because of their sectarian identity. Always please your boss, I guess, is the rule in <laughs> Iraq. Uh, Judge, uh, one question I have for you is, when did you decide that you needed to leave Iraq and get your family out of Iraq for, to a permanent place such as the United States for safety? ولما بدأوا يضربون بيتي بالصواريخ يعني أصبح الأمر صعب جدا. For two years there were continuous threats and I did send letters and petitions to the parliament about this issue of threats and then they started hitting my residence with missiles then it has become very difficult for me. I only wanted I only wanted a date if if that could be provided just a calendar date if possible for the decision. You can submit it for the record if you don't recall a date at the moment. لم أقرر إلا بعد أن حذرني رئيس الوزراء بمقابلته بالعراقية. I decided only when the prime minister warned me through an interview on Al Iraqiya. And the date? Can it be? The beginning of uh, September this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses here this morning uh, for their testimony, for their consistent help with the committee. Uh, and uh, Judge Roddy, particularly, I want to thank you for the courage that you have shown and the integrity of coming forward. Um, and Mr. Chairman, just for the record, I don't know, I, I had to go in and out at other meetings, uh, but if nobody has brought it up yet, I think that we ought to make a statement uh, that the State Department's attempt uh, to indicate that even broad statements and assessments that anyone might make characterizing the quality of Iraqi governance or corruption uh, and, and saying that that shouldn't be discussed, I think is a little bit bizarre, if not anything else, given the fact that there is $600 billion of United States investment in that country and the importance to the Iraqi people of having those investments come out through reconstruction and safety and security and other things. So this is a very germane issue that we are uh, investigating and talking about here this morning and important to delve into. Uh, but Judge Roddy, we have talked about uh, your statement that some $18 billion has been lost as a result of corruption. Uh, but if we can take just a minute to talk about uh, corruption at the Ministry of Oil, an area where I understand that you, that you have not yet been able to even have an audit uh, on that basis. You made a statement, and I will quote you, it has been impossible for the Commission on Public Integrity to safely and adequately investigate oil corruption where Sunni and Shia militias have control of the metering, transport and distribution of oil. So we are talking about billions and billions of dollars worth of Iraqi oil revenues basically the lifeblood of, of the country and, and a central obstacle to obtaining any political reconciliation. Uh, are you saying, sir, that even this, uh, given that importance, you have not been able to have audits or investigations into that ministry? Uh, 
out of this $18 billion total amount, only half a billion is uh, related to issues pertaining to the Ministry of Oil. بالنسبة للنفط طبعا مفتش وزارة النفط هو سوى تقرير من ثلاث أجزاء ذكر بالتهريب النفط وكيفية يعني المبالغ اللي تروح وكمية النفط وإضافة إلى التقارير الأمريكية والبريطانية وبالميديا حول الموضوع with respect to, to uh, the Ministry of Oil, the Inspector General of that ministry had issued a report of three, uh, that contains three sections. The I, uh, Inspector General of that ministry spoke about trafficking in oil, about the amount of funds uh, of these revenues, and about the amount of oil that was uh, uh, involved in this, in addition to the reports by U.S. and British authorities. There were two cases about a current and a former minister, and uh, the, these uh, uh, cases were closed. Okay. Let me uh, back up a second. The, so the, the reports on the oil ministry would have added to that $18 billion or were already incorporated in the $18 billion figure? It would have added. And Mr. Bowen and Mr. Walker, is it uh, your understanding also that militias are likely uh, in control of a substantial amount of money from the oil industry? There are a number of sources that report that. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, there, there's more information available on a classified basis, Mr. Tyranny. Well, thank you, Mr. Okay. Walker. Uh, Judge Roddy, in your statement, you say, and I quote again, this has resulted in the Ministry of Oil effectively financing terrorism through these militias. C can you tell us what you mean by that? Are you saying that, that these oil revenues were given directly to the terrorists? Yes, such as in Beji, in the central part of Iraq, there are Sunni militias that control this uh, region and they take a great share of these uh, uh, revenues and they use some of the amounts to uh, finance their militias. And the same thing goes to Basra where the, uh, the, the, the region is under the control of the Shiite militias. Well, thank you very much. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sort of reeling here because um, the testimony from everybody is such that I have virtually no hope left that any meaningful progress is being made in terms of rebuilding the infrastructure um, in Iraq in a way that's, that represents uh, true progress. And I think um, everyone's testimony puts a lie to assertions that progress is being made. Um, I would ask the judge, who, uh, whose testimony is courageous, but he's clearly a man of courage um, innately, um, what can you point to that would give me some hope that real progress is being made in combating the corruption that you're talking about today? As I said in my testimony, 
أغلقت كثير من القضايا. That the government has closed many cases. وتدخلت في شؤوننا خلاف الدستور. And intervened in our matters, and that goes against the constitution. وهذا اللي منع أن تظهر نتائج جيدة في مكافحة الفساد. That was the thing that impeded concrete good results in fighting corruption. Okay. So you really can't point to anything that would give me hope. Let me ask um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Walker or Bowen to, to, take that, um, to take that question. And maybe if you could just, either one of you, start by describing where you've seen a comparable level in your experience or from what you know or studied. Uh, if you could cite um, a comparable level of corruption in terms of the impact that it's having on infrastructure and services uh, within any society that you've you've looked at in recent past. I mean, w what can I look to to get a get a frame of reference on what we're talking about here? I don't know if I can give you a frame of reference, Mr. Mr. Sarbanes, but I will have some comments that are directly relevant to your line of inquiry. First, I think we have to keep in mind that corruption, as has been mentioned, involves the abuse of public office for private gain. Corruption happens all over the world at varying degrees. It's happened in Iraq for a long time. There is, however, a difference. The United States is dedicating a lot of lives and a lot of money in Iraq. And in general terms, I don't think it's any of our business to investigate corruption of other sovereign nations' money. However, when the United States has 160,000 troops on the ground, and billions of dollars invested, I think we need to be concerned with it, not to investigate it, to be concerned with it, because I think it can have a direct impact on the ability of the Iraqi government to, to achieve the 18 benchmarks that have been laid out for political, security, and economic progress in Iraq. And so that's why I think it's important. But I think there's a line that ought to be drawn as to how far we should go. With you, cite, you cited four um, elements that are impacting progress. Uh, one was employee shortage. Uh, the other was sectarian influence. The third was the corruption within the, the various ministries. And the other was security. So um, let's take employee shortage. Um, any prospects anytime soon that the employee shortage aspect of this will be fixed or remedied or progress much in a positive direction from what you've seen? Well, there's several angles there, one of which there's been a brain flight outside of the country because of the security situation. The question is whether and to what extent that might be able to be reversed. I think it's going to take a more stable security situation for that to be reversed in any significant numbers. Secondly. You have the debathification policy, and if political progress can be made on that, such that there might be a possibility to be able to tap some expertise from the former regime that may have, quote unquote, been Baathist, but not hard, hard line Saddamist, if you will, you might be able to achieve some progress there. But then I would ask Mr. Bowen whether, whether he has any perspective, because he's on the ground. Yeah, for, first of all, it's an employment issue. The real uh, problem in Iraq is unemployment which ranges up to 40 percent by some estimates. And that, that provides a breeding ground for uh, insurgent recruitment. With respect to the corruption effort or the, the attempt to stem the tide, we have issued two audits in the last 13 months that, that have found that the U.S. effort has not been well planned, well coordinated, or well funded. That notwithstanding that we created two-thirds of the anti-corruption bulwark, the IGs and the CPI. Uh, I, I spent a good portion of the first third of my uh, time in this job uh, taking on uh, the support of the IGs because of a vacuum of support uh, and, and pushing their, their, their growth, pushing their interests, trying to uh, – I pushed for an anti-corruption summit, which Ambassador Khalilzad held in November of 2005. But, but notwithstanding the, those efforts, p the plan, the coordination, uh, the funding uh, never came about. Unfortunately, it's disappointing, as our audits point out. Well, my time, my time is up. Um, I want to thank the witnesses, and, and I just want to um, 
highlight a comment that the judge made, which was to suggest that the infrastructure in Iraq is um, almost equal to zero and that the services, key services being provided by ministries in Iraq are almost equal to zero, zero which I think is a, a very damning assessment of where things stand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Mr. Shays? Before, um, let me just ask you, how many members do you have? Because I came here a little later and I'd be happy to wait a few more. How many more do you have? We have two more. I'd be happy to wait for one more and then I'll go. There are two of oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, then I'll go. First, um, Judge Al Rady, um, I want to say to you that you honor us by your presence. You are a very brave and distinguished man. Uh, we, I have known about you for a number of years, and I try to get to Iraq every three to four months. So to have you here is a real honor. I would like to say your decision to leave Iraq is understandable, but it is a huge defeat for good government uh, and uh, my hope of success in Iraq. And I'm very sorry that it's come to a point where you feel you need to leave. I um, first want to say to you, um, Mr. Walker, I get concerned when we from the outside looking in, and to you, Mr. Bowen, from the outside looking in are passing judgment on circumstances that I think are known uh, and yet there's recognizably very little solution. I mean, one solution is to give up on Iraq because it's corrupt. That's one solution. And I don't think you're suggesting that. No one can blame the U.S. government for the fact that the Iraqi government is corrupt. No one. Uh, you could blame us for going in. And let me just ask you, Judge Al-Rahadi, are, are you regretful that Saddam's regime was overthrown by the United States government? As I said in my uh, uh, opening statements, I thanked the United States because it removed a uh, dictatorship that oppressed the Iraqi people. Judge Rahadi, I know you said it, but it can never be said too much in an environment where most of Congress is critical that we did in fact do that. And so it is important for people to know, as I see all the time when I go into Iraq, thank you for coming now and getting rid of Saddam. But I do believe that uh, the people of Iraq could be very critical for what we did once we were there. What do you think the biggest mistake was that the American government made? I am not a politician, that's one. The second thing is that the Americans helped the Iraqi people by removing the uh, uh, dictator dictatorship. And what is happening now in Iraq is really the work of the neighboring countries. Wow. The Iraqi the, what? I'm sorry. The, the aspirations of neighboring countries, uh, of reg regional aspirations. Yeah. Should we give up on Iraq and wow. leave? Regional aspirations. Thank you. I want to ask the judge, should we give up on Iraq and leave? In, in reality, the Iraqi people would hope that you continue your support to them, otherwise they will be uh, suppressed okay. by the neighboring countries. So um, you appreciate the fact that the United States came in and removed Saddam, and you do not want us to leave. 
So tell me the bottom line issue of what we can learn by your testimony that will help make Iraq a better place uh, and not have your testimony be used by some as an argument that we should leave. In reality, um, it's a great endeavor that you came to Iraq and to liberate. Liberation was a great endeavor. And I believe if you help the Iraqi people to be managed and governed by a, uh, an honest government, I believe that the problem would be over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Shays. Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd li also like to thank all the witnesses. And I'd like to pursue for a minute the um, issue that uh, Congressman Tierney mentioned regarding the efforts of the um, administration to muzzle um, any discussion about corruption in Iraq. And uh, I'd like to address Mr. Walker and Mr. Bowen. Uh, as, as I know Mr. Walker knows, I was a journalist in my former life, and so I have a professional as well as personal interest in efforts to uh, uh, conceal information, uh, natural, natural resistance to that. And last week, the State Department uh, informed this committee that their officials would not be allowed to provide information about corruption in Iraq unless the committee agreed to treat it as classified and withheld it from, withhold it from the public. The State Department sent an email to committee staff confirming that virtually any dis Iraqi corruption was now classified. Let me show you what the State Department said was classified. The email said, broad statements or assessments which judge the, or characterize the quality of Iraqi governance or the ability or determination of the Iraqi government to deal with corruption, including allegations that investigations were thwarted or stifled for political reasons, and statements or allegations concerning actions by specific individuals such as the Prime Minister or other GOI officials or regarding investigations of such officials. Uh, Mr. Bourne, let me ask you first, is there anything that you said today that would have passed muster uh, according to this direct directive other than good morning? It's a pretty broad directive. Uh, it, it doesn't, was not in, and does not apply to me or my testimony today. I understand, but it, it, if such a policy did apply to you or your testimony, uh, what effect would that have on what you could do? Uh, a significant effect. <laughs> <laughs> would you be able to do your work if, you, if this policy were, were applied to you? It, 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 as testifying before this committee, I would have to be more circumspect about what I said. But everything I've said today, virtually everything I've said today, we've reported on in the past. And so uh, it, it, this is not new news. We, we first called the problem of corruption in Iraq a second insurgency over a year ago. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Walker, did, did you know that the State Department would consider the broad statement in your report that characterized the ability of the Iraqi government to deal with corruption, corruption to be classified information? No, several comments on that. First, my testimony is based on this report, which the State Department had an opportunity to review and comment on, and they did not classify any of the information in this report, which is the basis of my testimony. Secondly, I can understand why the State Department might have a concern if you were talking about specific individuals, because, frankly, in our own country, we would probably have some concerns about testifying with regard to ongoing investigations dealing with specific parties. But with regard to the broader challenge itself, I think it would be overreaching to try to classify discussions about the broader overall challenge. Right. I was going to ask you, the, the report that you submitted would not have, uh, if the State Department were to issue, this would have been, entire report would have been classified, wouldn't it, under those guidelines? Well, we did submit it to them, uh, yeah. both for comment, which we do under generally accepted government auditing standards, and secondly, also for sensitivity review and classification review. and they. What you have before you is unclassified. Mm -hmm. and as part of this new uh, classification policy, the State Department also went back and retroactively classified the reports issued by the Office of Accountability and Transparency. I understand that both GAO and the Special Inspector General received copies of these reports. 
uh, when they were unclassified. Uh, do either of you, uh, did anyone ever tell you that these reports were classified before you received them? No, and quite frankly, uh, I've seen at least two circumstances within the last uh, two months where both the State Department, this being one, and the Defense Department attempted to retroactively classify something that had been made available publicly and in some cases were on the World Wide Web, which is obviously, I think, uh, highly questionable. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's pretty obvious, Mr. Chairman, that we all know what's going on here. There's no real danger to national security from these reports. Uh, the State Department was fine, was fine with circulating them on an unclassified basis throughout the government, and it wasn't until this committee uh, asked to see the documents that they took this action. So it's, it's pretty clear that the administration just wants to muzzle any comments that are, reflect negatively on the Maliki government. And Will the gentleman yield to me on that point? Yes, Mr. Chairman. W we even asked one of the people at the State Department whether he agreed with a statement by Secretary Rice when she praised Prime Minister Maliki for his efforts to stop corruption. She even praised him. And we asked this fellow from the State Department, do you agree with that? And he said, I'm not allowed to discuss that in an open forum. <laughs> I, I can't believe the attitude that the State Department has taken in this regard. And uh, it's just incomprehensible to me. We're going to, uh, we're going to uh, insist on our rights at the, for the Congress of the United States to be able to get information about corruption in the Iraqi government. Their only excuse is that it might embarrass the Maliki government. Well, I think that the information that's already on the record, it's public knowledge, uh, it should be a source of embarrassment to the Maliki government and a source of concern to the U.S. government. The levels of corruption, according to General Walker and, and uh, Special Inspector General Bowen and Judge Roddy, is that uh, corruption is increasing in Iraq. And the State Department can't um, keep us from knowing that and can't censor that just because they think it might embarrass or hurt our relationship with Malik the Maliki government. Too many Americans are over there fighting and dying, uh, and too much Americans are paying taxes to support the efforts in Iraq for her to pretend something is not happening when we all know it is happening. Thank the gentleman for yielding to me. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, can Mr. I Chairman, real quickly? I, I testified that, that corruption is a serious problem in Iraq, and it is, but I, I can't attest as to whether or not it's increasing or decreasing based upon our work. Just well, I'm not citing you, but uh, both Mr. Oh, you're correct. And the others Roddy. did. I just wanted to be clear for the record. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I appreciate it. You covered that. yourself. Uh, Mr. Brayley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walker, it's good to see you again. Do you have any ulterior motive for being here today? I work for the Congress of the United States. This is our authorization op authorizing committee. I have no ulterior motive other than to serve my client. <laughs> Mr. Bowen, likewise, good to see you again. Do you have any ulterior motive for being here today? No, I'm responding to your invitation and, and uh, thankful for the opportunity to testify. Well, and I raise that interesting question because one of the witnesses on the panel with you has had questions raised by other members of the committee about his ulterior motive for being here today. And Judge Roddy, you were the top Iraqi anti-corruption official for several years. You investigated thousands of cases involving Shia, Sunni, and Kurds. And by being so persistent and even-handed, you made both friends and enemies. We've talked with many people in the U.S. government who are very proud to be associated with you. For example, Christopher Griffith is a senior advisor to the U.S. Office of Accountability and Transparency at the U.S. Embassy in Iraq, and he said this about you, quote, I think he is the most honest government of Iraq official that I have met in my 21 months in the country. He has never lied to me. He has tried to be studiously nonsectarian in his efforts, and I have worked closely with him. And to the extent that I would trust a government of Iraqi official, I would trust him. Judge Arthur Brennan, who was the Director of the Office of Accountability and Transparency in the Enemy, said this about you, quote, among the people that I've worked with in the U.S. Embassy, Judge Roddy had a reputation as a courageous, honest, and effective, and at least as effective as you could be under the circumstances as effective Director of CPI. And of course, you know Mr. Bowen, who's sitting next to you today. When you resigned your position last month because of escalating death threats against you and your family, Mr. Bowen stated, quote, it's a real blow to anti-corruption efforts in Iraq. He was the most prominent corruption enforcer. Mr. Bowen, do you stand by that statement today? Yes, I do. 
Last month, um, you were attacked by the Maliki government. Mr. Bowen, from what you know about Judge Roddy and his work in Iraq, in Iraq on these very important anti-corruption issues, do you believe there was any merit to those accusations? I found Judge Roddy to be my most reliable partner in carrying out my mission in Iraq. Uh, accusations are commonplace uh, within the Iraqi government, and I don't have uh, any information about the merits of them. Well, Judge Roddy, I just want to join the rest of the committee in thanking you for making the difficult journey here to share your important testimony with us. No one here understands what you've been through as a true and courageous person standing up for truth, standing up for justice, and we appreciate your efforts and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Bailey. Thank First, you. I want to ask unanimous consent that uh, the documents that were referred to in questioning, which both the sure, majority it's been and the mutually minority, agreed to, uh, uh, have looked at, uh, be admitted to the record. Without objection, that'll be the order. Uh, Mr. Issa, you yep. wanted to ask yep. a few I, more questions. I'm going to be be very brief. This is, believe it or not, this is my first round. But it's a way. If enough people yield to you, it seems like you've been here forever. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on on a question that I asked earlier, and I asked the question for a reason. Uh, we are putting in six billion dollars a month into the into Iraq uh, by anyone's rounding error. It's greater. It's less. It's huge. As that, as that huge amount of money, approaching a trillion dollars that's been spent in this uh, theater so far, why wouldn't we treat, and this is for uh, General Walker first and then for Mr. Bowen, why wouldn't we treat Iraq oversight of their corruption and of their use of their funds as we treated the Marcos government, as we uh, dealt with the post-Soviet uh, Russian period as we have dealt with Colombia and other countries in which drug money has had an adverse influence, why wouldn't this committee look at it in terms of the leverage of U.S. money? A and I ask that because although I don't believe we have yet made the case, I hope by the time we adjourn in a few minutes that we will have made the case that, in fact, this committee, in both an unclassified and with the Chairman's indulgence, hopefully in a classified setting, should be learning much more than any one individual can, uh, uh, can tell us. But I would go to General Walker first. In your opinion, your experience, is it appropriate for us to have oversight over the billions of dollars being spent of U.S. dollars and not see the effects of the other dollars? Because I would presume that for every dollar that we don't spend, the Iraqis would have to find a way to come up in many cases with those dollars. And for every dollar we contribute, we relieve their obligation to use their oil money wisely. General Walker. Well, first, I think this committee has a responsibility to aggressively oversee expenditure of U.S. funds, especially when it deals with contracting and other related activities uh, in Iraq. Secondly, I believe that in general terms it is not the U.S. government's responsibility, nor is it appropriate, for us to investigate uh, Iraqi sovereign money. However, I do believe it is in the interest of this committee, the Congress and our country to understand the nature and extent of corruption overall and to what extent does that undermine the ability of the Iraqi government to deliver on its promises with regard to funding and the ability of the Iraqi government to meet the 18 benchmarks that are necessary in order to achieve, quote, unquote, success. Right. And the second part of the question in your opinion, would that require a follow-up in a classified setting for this committee to fully understand some of what you and the State Department and other sources could give us? I, I clearly think it is in the committee's interest to obtain access to as much information as possible uh, and to the extent that there is information available that is uh, that's classified, then I would encourage you to avail yourself of that classified information, as I did in connection with the Iraqi 18 benchmark uh, report that we issued. Okay. Mr. Bowen. Yes, Mr. I said the uh, classified hearing makes sense since those reports are now classified and I have read them and they are uh, full of details about corruption within the Iraqi ministry, specifically cases, case details. So I think that would be useful for the committee. Uh, as to the first part of your question, the United States has enormous interest in the success of democracy in Iraq, clearly. That Iraqi corruption by the Iraqi government's own uh, admission threatens that state today. 
uh, the, this coalition provisional authority, a, a US, essentially a U.S. entity, created two-thirds of the Iraqi anti-corruption effort, the CPI, which, which Judge Roddy headed for the last three years, and the Iraqi inspectors general. And by creating them, took on the burden to build their capacity. They were new entities. Did not sustain that burden, as our audits have shown, either through effective strategic planning or appropriate funding. The way ahead, implicit in your question on that front, I think, is engaging those with expertise uh, in the issues you alluded to, international corruption and the fight against it. And that's the, that's the World Bank. They have two people in Iraq right now. I met with them in August. They have good ideas. They have no capacity themselves to address the issue. They need to lean forward and, and, and uh, deploy. And more broadly, other United Nations efforts, UNAMI, needs to engage, needs to make, be a presence. And ultimately, as with everything in Iraq, multilateralizing the solution will improve the likelihood of success of this fledgling democracy. Thank you. And, Judge, just in closing, I want to thank you for your courageous work over the last uh, several years. Hopefully, you understand that even though tough questions are always asked by this Congress, it is with great appreciation for the work that you have done in Iraq on behalf of your country. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. all of you and this uh, panel for your participation. We have uh, votes on the House floor. We will respond to those votes and be back here in 10 minutes because we uh, still have uh, Ambassador Larry Butler from the State Department and Ms. Claudia Rosette a, uh, uh, from a foundation requested by the uh, Republicans. So uh, we stand in recess uh, to respond to the votes, which I think should be in, back here in 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the meeting of the committee will please come back to order. For our uh, next witness, we're pleased to welcome Ambassador Larry Butler. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs, the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Mr. Butler, it's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify uh, take an oath. So if you would please rise. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, I'd, your prepared statement will be in the record in full, and I'd like to ask you to proceed in um, around five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for the opportunity to. to There's uh, a button on the base of the mic. Is it on, or maybe pull it, it closer? It is on, Mr. Chairman. Pull a little closer because it's. I hope that that should be a little bit better. Thank you, yeah. um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee. Um, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. Um, just to digress a little bit, uh, in the course of my 31 years with the State Department, I have served in countries like Finland and Denmark where corruption is virtually unheard of. In fact, this year, Transparency International's Corruption Index list lists those two countries in first and second place as the least corrupt countries in the world. I've also served in countries uh, that figure a little further down in the list, um, namely the countries that emerged from the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, where corruption had long been a way of life thanks to sanctions, conflict, and transition from totalitarian to communist regimes, corruption and lawbreaking was essential for survival at every level of society. Politicians sought elected and appointed office precisely to access public resources, not just for personal, but also for partisan benefit. The shift from socialist to private part ownership is frequently characterized as brazen daylight robbery by insiders, organized crime, and regime cronies. I may have contributed to the coining the term crony capitalism to describe Milosevic's kleptocracy during my service in Belgrade in the mid-1990s. We can, therefore, by extension, and without knowing any facts, presume that corruption should also be a serious problem in Iraq. It is in practically every other country in the throes of emerging from dictatorship and conflict situations. None of us 
should underestimate the challenges of establishing strong and transparent government institutions in the wake of a dictatorship where corruption was woven into the very fabric of governing. And none of us should underestimate the challenge of rooting out corruption in a combat zone, even one where violence is diminishing as we have seen over the past six months. The Department of State has devoted considerable effort and resources to helping courageous Iraqis establish mechanisms and procedures to investigate and prosecute corruption. This is paralleled by efforts to build the technical capacity of public institutions to execute their budgets in transparent and accountable ways. It is fair to say we probably do not have a program in the ministerial capacity development area that does not seek to be build an environment in which corruption is less prevalent. There have been, as we say, negative impacts due to the immutable law of unintended consequences. Mid and senior level bureaucrats have become gun shy about signing off on tenders and contracts for fear they may later be prosecuted. A well-intentioned but clumsily administered anti-corruption system can be used to punish the wrong persons. Our assistance ranges across a spectrum, a comprehensive spectrum, inter alia providing training to Iraqi anti-corruption teams, securing armored vehicles and body armor for them, re recommending changes in specific laws that we believe would help stem corruption. We are encouraged by what has been achieved to date while fully cognizant that much more needs to be done before Iraq's own anti-corruption effort is self-sustaining. This year, the Embassy established an Office of Accountability and Transparency with responsibility for overseeing our anti-corruption programs. We continue to add staff, including specialists in anti-corruption. We have urged the government of Iraq to establish its own interagency body to coordinate anti-corruption efforts and to share best practices. And they have done so by creating the Joint Anti-Corruption Council. We have welcomed the recommendations of Mr. Bowen of the Office of the Spe Inspe Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction and are taking steps to implement them. Although I represent the Department of State at this hearing, it is important to note that many other U.S. government agencies, including the Department of Justice and the Agency for International Development, have also made combating corruption an important part of their missions and programs in Iraq. We pursue these efforts across the country and not just in Baghdad. At the grassroots levels, for example, the Department of State funds a number of non-governmental organizations that target corruption and are seeking to create a civil society where government transactions are transparent and subject to the rule of law. In conclusion, I would be happy to answer your questions. I know you appreciate that some of the details, if discussed outside of a classified setting, can endanger the lives of those involved as well as impede our ability to work with the government of Iraq. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Butler, uh, the problems of corruption in Iraq uh, have enormous complications for our efforts in Iraq. It is undermining Iraqi confidence in their own government, it is funding the insurgency, and it is fostering sectarian divisions. All of those are major questions when it comes to uh, what is going on in the Iraqi government and the extent of corruption that is taking place. I believe it is essential for Congress and the American people to understand the extent of corruption in Iraq and its impact on our policy in Iraq. Now, our committee staff tried to ask the State Department officials about the corruption issue, but the State Department refused to allow them to provide any answers unless the committee agreed that all answers would be considered classified information and not, not discussed in public. And I want to read to you some of the questions we tried to ask uh, Vincent Folk, who is a senior consultant for the Office of Accountability and Transparency in the Embassy. We asked him, what effect does corruption have on the progress of the Iraqi government and their ability to, to uh, move toward political reconciliation? He was instructed that he could not answer this question in an open forum. We asked him whether Prime Minister Maliki or his associates obstructed any anti-corruption investigations in Iraq to protect his political allies. He said, I cannot answer that question in an open forum. Well, he and other State Department officials were also instructed not to answer questions about whether the Iraqi government has the political will to root out corruption and whether corruption is funding the insurgency. Ambassador, we live in a democracy. Our system of government depends on an informed public. 
what would be the rationale for preventing these officials from answering the committee's questions in an open forum? Mr. Chairman, it's a, a, a fair question, um, and, and per permit me to say that every Foreign Service employee at the State Department in their annual evaluation is required to, is, is, is evaluated on his or hers performance in protecting sensitive national security information and systems. I understand that. Is that sensitive at national security information to ask the questions that I, I just reported we asked? We heard earlier today, Mr. Chairman, graphic testimony from Judge Roddy about the risks, uh, the very real risks and the, and the price that he and his associates have paid in Iraq uh, in pursuing and attempting to deal with the, the corruption that exists in Iraq. Um, the programs that we have uh, contain two elements which are nationally sensitive. One is, is some of them are operational and we are not asking specific questions. We are asking general questions. And what I understand is that, um, is, is that the, the State Department people told us that to ask questions that were critical of the Maliki government would undermine our relationship with them and therefore it would be contrary to our foreign policy interests. Is that, does that make it classified? Uh, that very much falls under, under one of the provisions of the executive order uh, that, that provides the basis for classification, which is where, where revelation of information would damage bilateral relationships. Um, it is intended to be kept confidential. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me ask you some of these questions. You tell me if this is something that you think has to be kept confidential. Has Prime Minister Maliki or his associates obstructed any anti-corruption investigations in Iraq to protect his political allies? Um, I would be unable to answer that question in an unclassified setting, Mr. Chairman. And why is that? Um, this goes to uh, the nature of our relationship with the government of Prime Minister Maliki, and we have repeatedly on many occasions offered to the committee and to staff to provide uh, answers to questions like this the in American a classified setting. The American people want to know whether the government of Iraq currently has the political will or the capability to root out corruption within its government. Do you believe that the, the government of Iraq has that will? Um, I am in a position to detail many of the anti-corruption efforts undertaken by the government of Prime Minister Maliki. No, no, that's not the answer question I asked you. Do you believe that the government of Iraq currently has the political will or the capability to root out corruption within its government? Mr. Chairman, qu questions which go to the broad nature of our bilateral relationship with Iraq are best answered in a classified setting. And now we're, that we're, we're very, we're would very be prepared to do that. We're I mean, look at all the people we have in Iraq getting killed all the billions of dollars we are spending in Iraq. The American people are asking what are we doing and what are the chances for success? How are we going to have any chance of success if there is corruption going on in the Maliki government? If I, as a representative of uh, over 600,000 people and chairman of this committee, ask you from the State Department whether he has a chance to succeed, you can't answer that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have repeatedly uh, made I made clear our willingness to meet with uh, you and your, and your committee members in a closed session. Well, and Mr. Ambassador, I think that Secretary Rice is going to have a confrontation with this committee because we are not going to accept the idea that if you say something that could be negative about the Maliki government, it is classified. If you say something about them positive, it is okay. That seems to be what we have been told by the State Department. I consider that completely unacceptable. And we are going to have a confrontation on this because the executive branch must answer the questions of the legislative branch if we are to do our job. Uh, I, I, uh, I just think that um, this business, that uh, this cannot be answered, even a broad question in a public forum or a hearing of the Congress, is absurd. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are prepared at any time in, in the appropriate setting to answer your questions as to our best of our ability. Is it inappropriate for me to ask you whether you think the Maliki government is working hard to improve the corruption situation so that he can unite his country? Uh, a broad assessment along that line, uh, I would prefer to address in a closed setting. Mr. You prefer, Chairman. but do you feel that you have the right to say that you won't answer that question? Uh, my experience in 31 years of dealing with the Soviet Union, dealing with Milosevic's Yugoslavia, is I, this is I would prefer to address, be able to respond to that question in appropriate circumstances. Do you Mr. think Chairman? it would be appropriate if I asked you whether we should approve billions more for the Iraq War if the Maliki government is uh, not doing its best to stop corruption? Um, Mr. Chairman, clearly 
corruption is a fact of life on the ground in Iraq as it is in uh, any of the countries in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and unfortunately, as we find in our own country, this does not mean that we can give up on our efforts to root out corruption with the best of our abilities in, in this case, a sovereign country. Um, Iraq deserves the You best talked about Sweden. You talked about Yugoslavia. You talked about other countries and how they don't have a lot of corruption in the, in the, in the uh, Nordic countries. Did you have authority to make that statement from the State Department? Uh, each, each, each Foreign Service officer, each government employee who is uh, entrusted with national security information uh, has rather uh, has, is required to exercise their judgment as to, uh, as to what constitutes national security information. In this particular case, it is well established and on the record that Finland and Denmark rank one and two on transparency. Where does Iraq rank? Uh, pretty close to the bottom on Transparency International's list. Do you feel you could say that in a public forum? Uh, I can you mean certainly you just quote said Transparency it? International. And what's who, who are below them? I do not know. Well, I understand it's M Myanmar and uh, Somalia. That's uh, got to be way there on the bottom, and the rocks right next to them. Uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the line of questioning is is one that uh, I think it would be inappropriate to let let go of. Uh, you do publish, uh, I'm uh, the leading question, but you do publish or do you publish, as you do with Egypt and other countries, an annual report on Iraq, including its transparency and corruption? Um, we publish quarterly um, reports that we submit to the Congress, uh, 2207, I think is the And have those been provided to the committee? Those have been provided to the committee. And fully vetted do those or do those not say about many countries? And I, I've worked the Egyptian desk, so to speak, uh, so I've read those every year along with all the other areas of Levant. Iraq in that report looks better or worse than Egypt or other countries in the Levant, other Arab countries. Uh, the 2207 report is very specific to Iraq and I would not be able to draw comparisons to other countries. Does sir. it look pretty bad? Does it look like, in fact, you have a corrupt government in that report? Uh, I cannot recall this. In the 2207 report, I don't think we get very much into the specifics of, of uh, corruption. Okay. So do you think there should be a report that talks about a direction, improvement, or dropping off uh, in the level of transparency and or corruption in Iraq? Um, the embassy uh, under the direction of Ambassador Crocker ha has, is focused uh, and will continue to be focused on dealing with the issues involving corruption in Iraq. We've stipulated there is corruption in Iraq. Um, how to measure it, I don't know. Uh, this is a country that's undergoing <coughs> violence. Uh, it's, it's difficult <coughs> to figure out what are your definitions Well, of you mentioned the post-Soviet period. Hmm? Does it look a lot like Russia did? Looks very similar. Uh, many aspects of that do look similar. Okay. Uh, so in a post-dictatorship period, a post-organization period, an emerging democracy uh, with privatization, with systems that were previously subsidized in one way that are not being subsidized the same way now, it, to you, only wanting your opinion, is it not surprising, even if we didn't have the violence, even if we didn't have the insurgency, that this is, in fact, uh, pretty close to a basket pay case as far as legitimacy of the institutions of government in delivering services. Um, I don't would not I would not associate myself with with an, an assessment of close to a basket case. Uh, the government of Iraq is is in the process an ongoing process of a revolution of creating a government in a in a democracy where one did not exist before. As a is it better than the mid 90s in Russia? Uh, hard to make comparisons. Does it look reminiscent of the mid-90s in Russia? In some areas, uh, there, are many there are many similarities. Okay. What is Maliki doing, as far as you know, or key ministers of his, to fight corruption that you can say is being effective? D during the 18 months uh, that Prime Minister Maliki and his government have been uh, in power, and that's, I think, a key, key uh, number to, keep, to focus on, it's only been 18 months, um, he inherited the Commission on Public Integrity uh, as well as the Board of Supreme Audit uh, that were established prior to 
prior to uh, him assuming power, becoming the first democratically elected prime minister of Iraq subsequent to 2003. He created the Joint Anti-Corruption Council in May 2007. The prime minister has provided crucial support to the JACC's creation, which is an Iraqi solution to an Iraqi problem. Um, part of the Joint Anti-Corruption Council's agenda is to formulate recommendations, and this is one of the areas that I know came up earlier today, and this has to do with paragraph 136B of the Iraq Criminal Procedures Code. That's on their agenda to deal with. They, uh, they're also working with the inspector generals to create an association. Uh, they've created an association to coordinate strategic goals. Okay, and my time is going to run out, and I appreciate the yeah. long list, but let me just ask one question. Uh, the President has openly said that he's, I'll use, I'll characterize, disappointed in this government's movement toward passing certain almost universally agreed on need for reform, such as carbon sharing, such as these corruption laws. To the extent that they're on the agenda, you get no points. Do you see the likelihood that in a timely fashion they're going to be passed and enforced? I want your opinion, your assessment on that. I would need to, to take the this so-called benchmark legislation, which doesn't include anti-corruption uh, measures specifically, but they're all built in there. Um, we, Ambassador Crocker, work, working with Prime Minister Maliki, continues to work uh, towards achieving the legislative goals. In the meantime, two things I'd like to throw out there is that Prime Minister Maliki did something back in March uh, which dramatically improved one aspect where there had been corruption, and he, he put the Iraqi army around the Beji refinery uh, which had he started watching the oil. He started watching the, the refined oil specifically, which was literally going out the front and back gate, um, and it was ending up in the black market. The second thing the prime minister did, I think this is an important point, was followed an IMF recommendation uh, to, on two occasions, increase the price of fuel in Iraq, which reduced the disparity between the black market price and the street price, uh, which is which has taken is taken a huge bite out of the black market. Uh, some of that money was going into criminal networks, some of it was going to feed the insurgency. Those are very important steps to drain the swamp uh, that where insurgents and, and organized crime are operating. Gentlemen's time Thank has you. expired, but how can you say all those positive things about Iraq, but you can't admit to any of the negative things? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we acknowledge there is corruption in Iraq, and corruption by necessity uh, d you know, is, is defined as when government officials at every level uh, are not discharging their jobs. We recognize that, that it, this is a rapidly changing environment, and we have an embassy which is rapidly changing and evolving to meet and respond to the threat, if you would. Um, this but is I'm talking about what you were able to say in this meeting. You're able to say all the things that you think are positive that he's doing, but you're not able to talk about the failures of the Iraqi government, even though we had a panel that's given us very clear indication that this, this government is riddled with corruption. Why, why can you talk about the positive things and not the negative things? Shouldn't we have the whole picture? Mr. Chairman, I would be very pleased to answer those questions in an appropriate setting. <laughs> an appropriate setting for positive things is a congressional hearing, but to say anything negative has to be behind closed doors? Uh, this goes to, the, as you know, to the very heart of, of diplomatic relations and national security. This is our ability to. It goes to the heart of propaganda. Uh, Ms. Uh, Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Stuart Bowen and David Walker testified early today about the lack of leadership undermining the anti corruption efforts at the U.S. Embassy, Iraq. Mr. Bowen and Mr. Walker are certainly not alone in that sentiment. And as I sit here, and you know I've been there out in the field at a post, and any area of corruption, I reported it to the Secretary of State immediately. So on my watch, I would not allow it to go on with at least uh, making a statement about it. And I would go any place at any time to say that Americans' taxpayers' money was being abused and misused. So over the past few weeks, committee staff have interviewed several embassy officials involved with U.S. Embassy anti-corruption efforts, and they uniformly told us that no single official has been put in charge of U.S. efforts to combat Iraqi corruption 
and that there is no coordinated, coordinated strategy for fighting corruption in Iraq. Judge Arthur Bremen, who served as the Director of the Office of Accountability and Transparency for part of 2007, was asked whether there was an overall U.S. strategy for combating Iraqi corruption. And let me read an excerpt from his transcript. During the time you were there, were you aware of any coordinated U.S. strategy to fight corruption in Iraq? The answer was no. James Santel, rule of law coordinator at the U.S. Embassy, told committee staff the following. The embassy over time developed what are called stovepipe institutions. There is not coordination, as I have said before. You have a system where the coordination is lacking. Anti-corruption efforts are supposed to be a cornerstone of the United States effort to bring political reconciliation in Iraq. And how is it possible that these efforts could be in such disarray? Um, Ambassador, uh, uh, to take a moment and, and describe Embassy Baghdad, um, and the environment it's in, uh, and to pay tribute to the men and women of the United States, uh, as well as their counterparts in the Iraqi government who have stood up to tackle the very real challenges presented to the development of a market-based economy and, and, a, and a real democracy. Um, embassy, Iraq, embassy Baghdad is, is an embassy where it endures nearly 100 percent turnover every year and in a rapidly changing may, ex may external I stop environment. You, may I stop you there, Ambassador Butler, um, because our time runs out. But we have a fundamental responsibility to do something about the corruption. We were told in the beginning, of course I didn't support this war, but we were told that the monies from oil would support the war. We are waiting and not breathlessly, because I intend to vote against it, for another supplemental to put billions of dollars of money in there. I don't see even a light at the end of the tunnel. And I know how long it's been going on. I know how long this government has been set up. But I don't see the effort on the part of the state. I think we're at the point now. It's going to take politics and diplomacy, not guns and bullets. We can't kill everybody. We don't know what the enemy or the insurgents look like. So are we going to kill everybody that we think looks like or supposedly is? I think it's time for diplomacy. And we can't get from you on the ground, you know, what's going on. Is there a coordinated effort? How are you going after? And I know we have a relationship. It's a puppet government as far as I'm concerned. But we ought to model the right way to, at least that's where I was trained in the State Department. I was very proud of it. We had to model the right thing to do. And I spent my time going from island to island out there in Micronesia trying to get them to do the right thing because they were using our dollars. And I, I hear, I don't hear from the State Department what I'm expecting to hear. We have a fine tradition there. So what are these people who are new coming in and doing? Are we going after corruption? Are we pointing it out to Maliki? Are we saying, you know, you've got to show us that you're going after this corruption. These are taxpayers' dollars. And if we want support, whether I see. <laughs> but anyway, can you respond? I, I'm really disappointed in what I'm hearing. Uh, Ambassador, I would like to say I agree with what you just said. Um, one, the, both neither the GAO nor SIGER have found any evidence of corruption in, in the expenditure of U.S. taxpayer monies in Iraq, for which, uh, I, which I derive a certain amount of satisfaction. Um, and I also well, know that's the not an accurate statement. Nine billion dollars to Halliburton was missing. Brimmer was sitting right there at the table, and I he didn't know where the money went. Um, the SIGER reports that, that I looked at in, in have in, my, in the last couple of years that, that I went through show that you know, we've got pretty good uh, marks on our programs. Um, regarding we we've contracted. Ambassador, Ambassador 
Crocker takes fighting corruption very seriously. He has, as, as, as we do on a regular basis. Excuse he, me, he, Ambassador. Ambassador Bremer sat there and said he did not know where that $9 billion went. And so for you to say that you did accounting, there was no accounting. That money went in one way and there was no accounting. That was testimony. It's on the record. Uh, we would be happy to send that. And that was Ambassador at the time, Bremer. And he certainly didn't oversee that we had an accounting for $9 billion would do a lot in this time country is, uh, for our children. Time has expired. Me, I know my unless time you want to say something, we're going to move yeah, to thank Mr. You. Davis. Yeah, I heard something different in the testimony. I remember the Ambassador Bremer uh, saying that we gave it to people who gave it out. And <laughs> we, there weren't accounting systems further on down the line, but we gave it to the appropriate authorities. As you know, it was an emergency situation at the time. You had to start paying people um, and the like. And I, I, I gather that's your testimony. Uh, that's C I mean, this was CPA days, yes? Yeah. All right, and with, ex with accountable taxpayer money, and if I'm wrong on that one, sir, I, I do apologize, uh, IRFI money and others. This was Iraqi money, I think, is what it was. Iraq I, I believe that's correct, and it was CPA time as opposed to U.S. taxpayer right. money. Um, I think we take, we take our, our responsibility is to, to look after taxpayers' money very carefully, uh, very seriously. Just wanted to take a moment. Um, well, let me do this because I got yeah. five minutes and I don't want you answering her questions in my five minutes. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, page one of the strategy says that the basis of the problem of corruption in Iraq is market distortions, cultural tolerance, intimidation militias, undeveloped civic culture, lack of government capacity. What market distortions enable or foster corruption? Um, First and foremost, uh, when you're selling subsidized uh, or under, under market price fuel, we saw gasoline and diesel fuel being diverted all over the place into the hands of, of militias and, and organized crime networks who were selling it in the black market and pocketing the difference. That's, and that's, that's been taken care of. Okay, so we fixed that problem? It's being fixed. Describe uh, an example of cultural tolerance of corruption. For 35 years, the people in Iraq lived under a system where you had to play by the rules of the Ba'athist Party and Saddam Hussein. That would be the cultural. And if you wanted to survive, you paid whatever you had to to, uh, to the boss on, on top of you and do things that were for the regime and not for the, and not for the benefit of, uh, of the broad public. So it's like a little tip to get things. Uh, and something we saw, we see in, in the former Soviet Union and in the former Yugoslavia. What are, uh, well, it's not uncommon, in fact, around the world, is it? No. Uh, what are some elements of civic culture that would reduce corruption? Um, the lack of NGOs, civic, you know, civic associations, societies that serve as public uh, watchdogs who are able to come in and say uh, money has been wasted on this particular project and effectively become whistleblowers and, and can lobby in Baghdad or in the provincial governments. All right. What, what would you say is the key um, government capacity that is most important in establishing uh, fighting corruption? Would it be the IGs, the CPI, the BSA? And, and, and how do we prioritize? I wish it would, I could point to one thing that fights corruption. Corruption is, is a lot like a football game. You've got to play defense with the IGs and the other investigative bodies, but you also have to play offense. Uh, and that means you put in place the mechanisms, the te technical capacity to reduce the ability of people to put money in their pockets or steer contracts to, to cronies or family. We've heard a lot of questions about the classification of documents. I, I guess, though, really what I want to know is allow you to say what steps the U.S. Embassy is taking to assist the Iraqi government's uh, counter-corruption. Uh, how are the anti-corruption offices organized? Uh, what's the strategic plan to assist in countering corruption? How many people do we have involved with that? And how much funding are we allocating? Um, over the last four years, we've dedicated significant Iraq reconstruction rehabilitation funds to support Iraq anti-corruption. What's significant? Can you give me an idea of what's significant? I don't think I have a number for you. To me, $1,000 is significant, but to a case like this, what is, of course, I'm a government salary. So, <laughs> but what is a significant amount, ballpark? Is it um, tens I, of millions? I would, I would have to come back to you on that one in writing, sir. Oh, well, okay, I think we need to know that, okay. Yeah, I'll come back for the record, please. Okay. Um, keep going. 
uh, as a result of you, that was that was in, to support the, um, uh, the C, both the CPI and the, and the board of the Supreme Auditors. Um, as a result of the USG assistance to the Commission on Public Integrity, the CPI has conducted over 4,000 investigations and made several high-profile arrests, including the former Minister of Electricity, Minister of Labor, a number of officials of the Ministry of Oil, and referred more than 2,000 cases for prosecution to Central Criminal Court. INL also funds Department of Justice resident legal advisors. These are U.S. prosecutors who advise and mentor uh, criminal court justice, justices in all manners of serious cases. We have also funded Department of Justice ISETAP advisors and specialists to train, train and mentor the investigators from the Commission of Public Integrity. There were 11 of these investigators who came back with Judge Roddy to learn how to do polygraphs. Every one of them, those investigators, went back to Iraq to go get back to, back to work with their new skills. Um, I, the I, IRF also works to enhance investigative capacity of the CPI as well as provide equipment for their investigators. Um, and most recently, we have just signed a grant with the Organization for uh, Economic Cooperation uh, and Development uh, for I think about a $1.3 million grant uh, through, uh, to complement efforts on the International Compact for Iraq, one, sorry, $1.6 uh, million um, uh, to, to, to do the business side of anti-corruption efforts. And this is precisely our efforts to multilateralize a problem that we have been attacking just by ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the witness for, for coming forward. Uh, look, <clears throat> I, I know you said we get higher marks for our job, but uh, I, I'm trying to find evidence of that in the record here. Uh, we have a, an assessment uh, that currently there is no single office that has the authority or responsibility for oversight and to assure that all anti-corruption efforts are focused on a common goal uh, or that efforts are being performed in an efficient manner. Uh, we have got evidence here that, that uh, the Office of Accountability and, and, and uh, Transparency has been hampered from the beginning by a lack of support and leadership. Uh, the office has only had one permanent director, Judge Brennan, and he, he lasted a month. I heard he was doing a good job, but again, he was only there for a month. Uh, now, I know that the Inspector General, Stuart Bowen, had, had recommended that, that, that you appoint a senior leader from the Department of State to run the office, and yet we have evidence that uh, actually, by default, the, the acting uh, head over there was actually a paralegal doing administrative work. And so instead of a, an experienced uh, senior department person, you've, you've got an inexperienced paralegal. Hey, some paralegals are great, but not, not to run this critical agency. Uh, there's a, a lot of testimony here that, that you're not getting high marks, to be honest with you. And then, uh, you know, when we ask you about the level of corruption here, we are getting answers like uh, we don't want to talk about any broad statements or assessments uh, to judge the level of corruption in Iraq. And yet we I think we have sent $450 billion over there so far. How, how does that square with, with you know, your constitutional responsibility and ours? The um, embassy. The U.S. government has invested heavily in the last couple of years in broad-based anti-corruption efforts. Um, in the first instance, this is the plain offense side of it uh, to develop capacities in ministries, and more recently through the provincial reconstruction teams to develop capacities at the provincial and municipal levels, uh, which are showing uh, are very promising early days. Well, let's talk about that. You tell me. You tell me. You, you know, you've got this. Uh uh, refusal here to testify in any detail about the level of corruption in Iraq that we know is going on. How, how, how do you reassure us uh, in Congress, representing the American people, they are looking for more money over there, and yet you won't even tell us about what you have found in terms of the level of, of corruption and whether things are getting better or worse over there? You won't get into any of the details that the first panel talked about? I mean, how, how does that square? I, I just, uh, we have a problem here. We have a problem of constitutional dimensions here. 
Now, I respect the job that you do. We all do. But it appears that you don't have the same respect for the job that Congress must do. We have an oversight responsibility, not to sign a blank check, but to find out how progress is being made uh, in terms of the resources that we've committed to this. Congressman, um, two things. One, we have provided to the committee all the documents uh, from the embassy that we were able to find uh, related to corruption. Uh, and second, we have made it clear that we are prepared to answer your questions in an appropriate setting. Uh, we are prepared to do that at any moment. Look, uh, I will leave it at this. This is a matter of transparency. Do you see the irony here? You are saying you have actually established a, a committee on accountability and transparency for the benefit of the Iraqi people. And yet here, when we ask you to, to exercise the same transparency with respect to your responsibility to the American people, you are claiming that there is a, there's a uh, level of confidentiality that is required that we can't actually tell the American people, the American taxpayer, what we're doing with their money. And, you know, it just, uh, it, it, it's just ironic that you're standing there. And I know it's not your decision, sir. It's, it's, it's just, it, this decision was made at the secretariat level. Let's, let's be frank. And I know you're just here doing your job. But uh, Mr. It, is, it is totally disrespectful uh, to the American people. Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, the issues and the aspects that are involved in the fight against corruption in Iraq uh, risk people's lives. You heard that from Judge Roddy earlier today, what has happened to him and, and, and to his colleagues. It in potentially endangers the lives of fellow Americans who are on, on but the But, sir, ground. if it wasn't for his testimony, we would never hear about it because you, you've got a gag order on, on at the State Department. It was his testimony that we're discussing today. But State Department has offered no clear uh, assessment. You haven't really fulfilled your responsibility to the American people, in my opinion. We, are, we have uh, provided the documents as requested. We have also provided um, uh, the witnesses, the individuals that have been deposed in the last week, and we are prepared in a classified setting to answer questions to our best ability in detail. Very disappointed. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chase. I am not disappointed with your testimony. Uh, in my judgment, uh, you are being asked to say that individuals in Iraq are corrupt, and then we have to work with those individuals. And I don't see how that helps our soldiers win in Iraq. I don't see how it makes us safer in Iraq. I'm accused sometimes of being a pretty naive person. I don't think I am, but I'm accused of it. But the one thing I'm willing to say is Iraq is corrupt. We knew it under Saddam, and we knew just because we invaded them, they wouldn't all of a sudden become pure and uncorrupt. So I'm not amazed by it, and I would be pretty horrified if you started depicting every leader in Iraq that th we thought was corrupt. I'd also like to correct for the record, if it's $415 billion or $600 billion, those dollars are not what we're talking about. We're talking about Iraqi government officials ripping off their fellow constituency with their dollars, to which we do not have control. And I love how we ask people in Congress to let them have their autonomy and, we, and, and respect their autonomy. And then when we don't like what they're doing, then we say we've got to step in and criticize them. So this is where I think there is valid reason for this hearing. It is an absolute waste of our time if we are all of a sudden discovering that the Iraqis have a corrupt government. That would be foolish. The real issue is what are the things we can do to make it less corrupt? That is the issue. And I think it was valid for uh, both the Inspector General and the head of GAO to say there should be one person in the embassy totally focused on that issue. And I want to be on record as saying I hope that the State Department will consider that recommendation. I think it's constructive and I think it would be helpful. I'd like to ask you uh, about your reaction to Judge Radi um, Amas, uh, excuse me, the, the Judge uh, Al Radi uh, and his testimony. What I know of him is that he is an incredibly honest and dedicated Iraqi who happens to be a Shia and that he has, you know, met the point where he doesn't feel that he can continue. Uh, but I also heard him say that he was happy the United States came in and removed Saddam. 
I heard him say that it would be a huge mistake for the United States to leave. Is his leaving Iraq first, what is your impression of the job he did, uh, his testimony, uh, and can you speak uh, to that? Um, uh, Congressman, thank you. I can only offer tribute to the courage and the tenacity of the judge and his departure from the scene is a blow. Um, and it may be a while before somebody uh, with his, his capacity and willingness uh, steps in to replace him. Will it make it harder for Iraq to deal with corruption when you lose someone who is so brave and so talented? Um, it depends. Uh, it depends on, on, on how the system responds. Um, it's possible this serves as a shock to the system. Uh, but certainly, uh, it, Ambassador Crocker uh, has this week has ordered a review of how the embassy attacks anti-corruption. One branch of it is how we develop capacity, and this is the offensive side, is you know, creating systems where it's harder to be corrupt at the same time as continuing well-established track record on developing Iraq's own sovereign ability to deal with corruption. This is going to take time. Right. There's, there's, there's no hiding that. Now, it's his testimony, I think, that he didn't feel he got the help from the, the Maliki government that he felt he deserved. Was that your reading of his testimony? Um, I, I'm not asking you what you think. I'm asking you what you heard. I didn't listen to all of his testimony, okay. Mr. Mr. Congressman. Well, the testimony uh, was fairly clear that he felt that he was taking a tough stand and was not getting the support of the government. Since they offered to kill him, I would say that's an understatement yeah. that they didn't offer to support him. Uh, they threatened his life. Uh, it, his testimony was he was not getting the support and he felt his life was threatened. Um, and I have met other people like him, uh, people like Mithal Alalusi, who has done very brave things and his life is threatened. That's nothing new for the folks that are trying to work on this government. So I appreciate that he was here. He thinks it would be s helpful if there was someone within the embassy that could be uh, uh, more focused on this issue. I think it's a constructive part of this hearing to which, um, uh, Mr. Waxman, I thank you for uh, helping to focus attention on that issue. Uh, but if it's to say that people in Iraq, the government is corrupt, given 35 years under Saddam, uh, there would be nothing that would tell me it would be different now that you have a uh, government to which I might add is concerned that we might pull the rug out from under them and that they may not even exist. Yep. May I ask, uh, Mr. Shays, do you think this is an appropriate question? Has Prime Minister or his Prime Minister Maliki or his associates obstructed any anti-corruption investigations in Iraq to protect his political allies? Do you think that's an appropriate question? Of course. And is there anything that you would think that I would think it wasn't appropriate? Well, Ambassador Butler refused to answer it. Um, Ambassador Butler offered to answer that in a closed setting, Mr. In Chairman. In a closed forum, and, I, and it, so I would answer your, your point. I think things about the Prime Minister uh, uh, should be done behind closed uh, doors uh, and let Congress decide and listen to the testimony. I don't think we should have government officials uh, be exposing uh, people in those leadership. Well, how about this question? Do you believe that the government of Iraq currently has the political will or the cap capability to root out corruption within its government. Do you think that's a legitimate question to get I, an answer? I, I would hope that uh, the, the ambassador would uh, share with us uh, his sense of that, yes. Would you like to? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, we, we have provided an assessment of, of the concrete examples of the Maliki government's efforts on anti-corruption as well as a general overview of the embassy's anti-corruption efforts, which is a very appropriate subject for this hearing. Um, and the questions and messages we intend to, to transmit back to Ambassador Crocker, um, a, a, an overall assessment of the Maliki government. But how uh, about an answer to that question? Um, I, I would prefer. The question is do you believe that the government of Iraq currently has the political will or the capability? to root out corruption within its government? That's it's really a two-part question. Uh, it, it's an assessment, again, I would prefer, because of the nuance involved in it, to do that in a, in a classified setting, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. In this hearing today, we've seen a pretty stark contrast. We saw in the first panel Judge Roddy, who is risking his life to tell us the truth. And here you are in the position of not being willing to risk your career to tell us the truth. I'm not faulting you. Most people 
would want to risk their career. But we have the responsibility of raising money from the American people to pay for this war. And Judge Roddy told us in his testimony that, quote, the cost of corruption that my commission has uncovered so far across all the ministries in Iraq has been estimated to be as high as $18 billion. Now, maybe that's Iraqi money. Uh, my friend Mr. Shays tried to make that point, but money is fungible. And I think total U.S. appropriations for reconstruction in Iraq has been about $20 billion. And if money is fungible and they can swap Iraqi money for dollars, we may have been party to taxing American citizens to pay for massive new levels of corruption, heretofore unseen in Iraq. We have been in the country for four or five years now. They haven't exactly pulled out of the bottom of the ratings and the corruption index. The dispute we have had over what is an open testimony and what is classified, the viewers should understand that it is not what we hear in a classified session. You know, We would like to learn as much as we possibly can. But by hearing it in that session, then we are unable to talk about it. So the taxpayers don't get any new information. If you can't tell us here, they will not learn a thing. And here, sir, the people rule. And after four or five years of this, a longer engagement than World War II, they're kind of wondering what we should do. And we need to supply them with answers. And it shouldn't be an ideological dispute. So let me ask you, I talked about the Jones Commission before an excellent, independent, bipartisan commission that reported last month, led by Marine Corps General James Jones. And he said, sectarianism and corruption are pervasive in the Ministry of Interior and cripple the ministry's ability to accomplish its mission to provide internal security to Iraqi citizens. He said it was basically it was so bad, we got to disband the whole thing. What is your opinion? of Mr. General Jones's view of the Ministry of Interior's behavior. Is he right or wrong? Uh, Mr. Congressman, the, in 2004, the, uh, the U.N. restored sovereignty to the Iraqi government. Um, the recommendation to what happens with the, with the um, Ministry of Interior and the police forces, it would be a decision for the uh, Iraqi people, the Iraqi Council of Representatives and the Iraqi government. Um, your first comment, my job here is to protect the lives and the interests of the people that are in Baghdad and throughout the country from Erbil down to Basra. Um, some of the details that have been alluded to would have the potential of compromising their relationships and, and, and operations. I am sure you will appreciate that. This is the military calls it operational security OPSEC. Um, and the second part of it is our ability to have influence and be able to maintain trust with our interlocutors in Iraq um, is something which is very much covered by, by national security information. Uh, it is a judgment call, uh, and I have, the, I have an obligation to them, um, not to my career, uh, but to the people who can't be here to, to answer your questions but have a very hard job to do. Judge Roddy and, and his colleagues risked their lives, some lost their lives. He's left his country and his homeland um, and done a courageous thing by coming before the committee. Uh, there are folks still there who have to finish the job, and the job will take as long as the job talk, uh, as, long, as long as the job takes. Um, I can't predict when it will end. I've never seen a corruption entirely rooted out or defeated anywhere. Um, but the Iraqis, because it, it's their country, have to develop the capacities, and your oversight. Uh, is, is more than appropriate. It is very welcome uh, to make sure that we in the uh, executive branch are doing what we are supposed to do, uh, what we can do to support Iraq, develop the institutions and the capability to reduce corruption to the point where it doesn't affect economic development, where it doesn't fuel sectarian tensions and helps this country become a strong and vibrant democracy. Marine Corps General Jones is as patriotic as you are. Um, Mr. Bowen, the SIGR, Inspector General Iraq, is as patriotic as you are. They are telling us what sounds more like the truth than what you are, at least in an open setting. 
Uh, final point, I see my time's running out. Uh, Secretary Rice said in October 2006, quote, they, the Iraqis, need to do more of the kind of thing that apparently the Interior Ministry is trying to do. So here she is in a public forum complimenting the same ministry that General Jones tell us is so sectarian, so corrupt, basically the Iraqi police need to be disbanded. Why is our Secretary of, the S Secretary of State saying things that are so directly at odds with the Jones Commission. Um, General Jones and, and his very distinguished panel uh, who spent considerable time in Iraq uh, in, in August and September um, did so as private citizens with considerable extraordinary service uh, in uniform to the country and, and the police service as well. Chief Ramsey was a member of that commission. Certainly respect their professional judgments based on what they saw or heard out there and, and we're looking very hard at it. Um, the Department of Defense, um, as you know, uh, has primary responsibility for the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense. I see that my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think the American people would sit by idly and quietly if, if we were having secret discussions about $18 billion worth of taxpayer money going out the door through corruption. Uh, and I don't know of any situation where corruption has ever been uh, defeated or, or diminished with secret meetings as opposed to shining uh, light on it and bringing it out to the public right and, and the public coming forward, whether they're Iraqi citizens or American citizens, demanding something be done. Uh, I mean, these hearings are about finding out who's corrupt, how that corruption is playing out, what should be done to stop the corruption, and to an extent our governors, what are we doing about it and how is it going? We're not doing very much when uh, Judge Brennan, the former director of the uh, Office of uh, Accountability over there, says he's he does, he's not aware of any coordinated U.S. strategy to fight corruption in Iraq. When James Santel, who supervises the activities of that OAT organization, he's the rule of law coordinator for the embassy, told us, you have a system where the coordination is lacking. And Michael Richards, the executive secretary of the anti-corruption work group, says basically he'd like to be able to say that they've done quite a bit in this area, but unfortunately they've not. Vincent Falk, who's a senior consultant in the Office of Accountability and Transparency, was the primary drafter of two reports issued by the OAT in December of 2006 and another in July of 2007. Those reports assess the anti-corruption efforts of the Iraqi government, something you feel now would be just real high security risk to dissolve. According to him, these reports were not classified when they were drafted. They were not classified when they were issued. They were instead marked sensitive but unclassified. Now, both Christopher Griffith, senior advisor to OAT, Judge Arthur Brennan, the former director of OAT, as I've said, confirmed that those reports were not classified when they were issued and they were not classified when they were drawn. Are you aware of those reports? Um, Mr. Congressman. Uh, Are you aware of those reports, sir? I've only got five minutes and I really want answers more than, than talk. I have, in the last couple of weeks, become aware of working okay. documents prepared by OAT. Were you aware that those reports were not classified when they were drafted and issued? by the Office of Accountability and Transparency. We only found out three weeks ago these, were, these documents, working documents, even existed. All right. And did you become aware that those reports have been widely distributed both within the embassy and with other relevant agencies by email? They were not widely distributed uh, within the U.S. government. You say they were not? All right. Well, if they would have been, I, we would have known about it in, in my office. All right. Did you know that they were apparently distributed to others although maybe not your office, surprisingly so. I'm unaware of the distribution of these internal working documents of the OAT. Interesting. Well, Scott Wynn is the acting rule of law coordinator for the U.S. Embassy in Iraq, told the committee staff that he was asked to do a classification review of those reports shortly after this committee went and asked for those reports to be given to the committee for this investigation. Mr. Wynn then told the committee he had never even done another, a classification review before. So why is it that when we ask for these documents, Mr. Wynn is suddenly asked to review the documents for classification when he has no experience in that field at all? I'm reminded uh, of the very first security infraction uh, and then almost the last one I had in the Foreign Service was as a junior officer, I wrote a message back to Washington that my superior, that I marked unclassified and when I went to my superior, he upgraded to confidential. I didn't spot it, tossed it in my wastebasket when I finished with it and got a, vi got a pink slip from the Marine the next day. Um, this is. This is the responsibility of classification authority. Uh, these documents were not properly 
properly classified and, according to the embassy, have subsequently been appropriately classified given the sensitive nature of the information contained therein. I, you know, this report, the one that you thought wasn't circulated, was first given to Ambassador Saloum and his chief of staff. Five days later, it was given to the anti-corruption working group, the entire group, and then it was given uh, it, to the rule of law coordinator and others. So apparently you were out of the loop, but it was distributed uh, broadly in that, within that group on that basis. Congressman, every person you've mentioned is in, inside the embassy. I'm, I'm it also went to the GAO and the Special uh, Inspector General. It, it did, did not come back to Washington. We were unaware of the existence of that So that's report. the key. As long as it doesn't come back to Washington, it can be disseminated around the embassy to the GAO and to the SIGR. My understanding this was an internal draft working document which had not been blessed as an embassy document. And you thought it was important not to share it with this committee and to have it uh, accept as a classified document? Uh, we provided it. Uh, your committee staff was able to review it uh, up upon us finding out about it, and we provided hard copies uh, shortly thereafter, sir. Can you see it all or appreciate it all the fact that this committee and probably the public finds it bizarre that something is retroactively classified uh, on a public hearing about corruption, uh, which weighs on the safety of our men and women over there? Testimony today some. $18 billion, that's without looking at the oil ministry, without looking at the interior ministry, of money that, according to the testimony today, is going in the hands of militia, those same militia that are shooting at our troops. And your story is, well, we can't talk about that publicly. It's embarrassing to us, and it might get the Iraqi government upset uh, when the public knows that they're engaged in it as well. Congressman, you, you phrased that well, the safety of our men and women in the embassy and those who are working on the anti-corruption uh, uh, deserve the protection of the classific proper classification of that document. What they deserve, sir, is a full investigation so that we understand the depth and breadth of it so that we can do something about it instead of having people say that it's a disorganized department, a system where the coordination is lacking, where there is uh, no awareness on the part of the director of OAT of any coordinated U.S. strategy to fight corruption and where that money that is being corruptly taken out of circulation is given to militias who are shooting at our people. That's why we're having the hearing and that's why maybe we'll wake you all up so that you have a coordinated effort at OAT and the working group and start doing something about it and we'll find out who's involved with it and get it done so that our people aren't being shot uh, with money, even weapons bought from money as a result of corruption. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Ambassador Butler, uh, Stuart Bowen and David Walker testified earlier today that there's a lack of leadership undermining the anti-corruption efforts at the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. And Mr. Bowen and Mr. Walker are certainly not uh, alone in that sentiment. We've also heard uh, in other interviews from several embassy officials that uh, there's no coordinated strategy for fighting corruption in Iraq. Now, maybe you don't want to talk about this issue because the U.S. Embassy is not doing its job. How do you respond to that? Um, the Sear report of um, July uh, did a couple of things. Uh, one, there, you know, there, and the previous year that there should be a consolidated anti-corruption strategy, which was prepared in 2006, and then subsequent to this year's Sear report. Uh, Ambassador Crocker has convened and designated a person to conduct a full anti-corruption internal organization review. So you, you're doing better? We're, we're attacking the problem when we find the problem, mm -hmm. sir. Well, we learned um, a couple days ago when we looked at Blackwater, which works for the State Department, that there was no real oversight that the State Department was providing with regard to Blackwater in troops and uh, they're a private military. And now I'm wondering what kind of job the State Department is really doing with this conflicting testimony in oversight in terms of anti-corruption efforts. And I think this is going to be uh, uh, a serious matter that we're going to have to review. I also want to just end uh, by saying that I think your position is absolutely absurd that you cannot answer questions in an open forum that the American people are entitled to have answered before we appropriate more money to put into this war effort in Iraq. I just cannot understand it. So when I say we're going to have a confrontation with the Secretary, we want to know whether the State Department is doing its job of oversight with the private military that they've, em they've uh, employed, whether they're doing job of oversight with regard to anti-corruption efforts, which our embassy should be supporting more strenuously, and we want to know why the State Department is refusing to talk to Congress and give us answers to questions that ought to be given in a public uh, forum. 
So I, uh, I put that out there not to, uh, to address, have you address it, but I just want to put you on notice and the State Department on notice that we're going to have to resolve these uh, matters. Mr. Davis, anything further before we move on? Well, let me just ask, what's the long-term hope over there? Uh, we're spending uh, over half a trillion dollars uh, to try to bring democracy and the rule of law uh, to this country. And the, the question I think a lot of us face is, are we giving birth to a democracy or are we babysitting a civil war? Um, Mr. Davis, that, that really is the fundamental question. Um, and my faith is in, in the people that are working on this, uh, both in the, the men and women in uniform under General Petraeus's command and the men and women who work for Ambassador Crocker. Um, democracy is not easy. It's hard. Uh, it takes time. It takes imagination. We have a phenomenal team out there. Um, and I, want, I very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, value your candor uh, and appreciate the committee's attention to these issues because corruption is something that I've had to deal with in just about every assignment I've had in the last, the last decade. This is hard. I've never seen anything as complicated as, we, as presents itself in Iraq with a combat zone going on, the influence of the neighbors, and add to it the, the oil, oil resources. Um, I'm confident that Ambassador Crocker is the right leader. He will, together with Jim Santel, the head of the Rule of Law Department, get that part of it organized. At the same time, we haven't really emphasized this very much, Mr. Davis, but the efforts to develop the capacity of the Iraqis themselves, invest in people, invest in, in you, know, you know, sort of help us, you know, bureaucracies that are able to deliver services and, and support the democratic institutions that are accountable to the people and that the Iraqis themselves can be proud of and not afraid of. I think we share that goal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, for your, thank you for your testimony. Just for the record, total funding for ongoing and planned anti-corruption activities through June 15, 2006 was approximately $65 million or less than 0.003 percent of the total Iraqi IRRF funding to date. That's uh, just so we have the perspective of how much we're doing financially in that area. Uh, we're now being called. Uh, thank you, Vice President. We're now being called for a uh, vote. We'll respond to the vote and then come back and hear uh, the last witness. Hearing of the committee will come back to order for our. Um, Last uh, witness, we're pleased to welcome Claudia Rosette, a journalist in residence at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. We're pleased to have you with us today. It's the custom of this committee to ask all witnesses to uh, uh, answer questions under oath, so if you please stand. You uh, solemnly swear you will, you will answer the questions uh, uh, truthfully to the best of your ability. Thanks. Uh, your prepared statement will be made in part of the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to um, present your oral uh, statement in around five minutes. Button on the base of the mic you need to push. Good afternoon, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much for the chance to testify here today. Um, I hope I can be of some help in providing some background and context for what you have been discussing. These are extremely important matters. Is the mic at a good distance here? Okay. Um, and listening to it, there are a few things. I want to mention, because I think they may be important, and I could not agree more with you, that corruption is a huge problem. Uh, and it's one that should concern people, whatever side of the aisle, whatever. Um, a brief story I want to tell you. I, I worked in Russia in the mid-1990s. I was the Moscow bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, uh, a reporter there before that. And there were no rules at that point. The Soviet Union had just collapsed, and uh, it was very hard to know what applied anywhere except corruption was the way anything that worked worked by corruption. And there came this horrible cold day, and the Iranians down the hall were trying to make the fuse box work again, and I had to file a story, and I couldn't get anywhere. And finally, in misery and desperation, it was freezing. I called a man who won a Nobel Prize in economics for 
looking at the interaction between political institutions and economies, exactly the nexus where corruption takes place. His name is Douglas North, back in the States. And I said, how long is it going to take for them to sort out the institutions so that this place works? And he said, oh, about 50 years. I thought, oh my god. <laughs> That's, I think, the real time horizon. And if I could just suggest, uh, and I, what I want to get to is Iraq was immensely corrupt before the period that you've been discussing, in the time when Saddam was there. And it's terribly important in understanding how to address this. I don't think anybody here who uh, you know, prays the judge and understands the pro some of the problems there wants to simply leave it. But to understand it matters greatly. There are different kinds of corruption. Um, and it is something that is extremely complicated to clean up. I've seen it in countries in the Far East, in the former Soviet Union, and I've spent the past five years looking at how it worked when Saddam Hussein was in Iraq, because it was intimately entwined with the United Nations Oil for Food Program, which I've reported on and reported on. Um, corruption is something that tends to sort of improve as a place becomes more democratic, but it's an organic process. It's not something where you can sort of do it step by step. And uh, it's also not all about fighting it with agencies. Um, there is a tremendously important component that comes with simply getting rid of bad rules. It's the difference between, say, a Bangladesh with very high tariffs where trading in just normal goods like soap and socks can be illegal and corrupt, and Hong Kong, where it's a free market and it's legitimate trade. And there's not such reason for officials to have their hand out. Anytime you see these levels of corruption, uh, as you do in Iraq, and have for a long time, that's part of, a big part of the problem. A further item that I think just needs consideration, this can be discussed and explained in many ways, but corruption does not necessarily bring down governments. That may be unfortunate. But I did, in fact, print out the Transparency International latest list just out. And in my written testimony, mentioned that Iraq is third from the bottom. But they're bunched up a great, great many countries way down near the bottom on the scale of one to nine. And if you look, you'll also see that Iran is not so different. You know, would that it were the case that enormous corruption would just hollow out and bring down a regime. It doesn't necessarily follow in that way. It's not, one can deplore it, and yet countries on this list, uh, sort of very close to this level of corruption, include some like Russia, Syria, Azerbaijan, Belarus, where the dictator has been in power for years, um, Venezuela, and so forth. So just to say this is a complex scene. And in the short time here, it is like something important to understand in Iraq. Under Saddam Hussein, it was immensely institutionalized. Corruption was so much part of the government that in one of the fascinating scenes in a federal trial that just concluded with the guilty plea in New York on Monday was an Iraqi witness who ran the corruption database for the oil ministry in the hundreds of millions of dollars of kickbacks that poured in when Saddam began collecting kickbacks on oil for food contracts, they actually set up officially inside their state marketing organization an entire section, database, cabinets, employees who did nothing but track graft. And this really was graft. It had to come through front companies. It was something that violated the agreements that Iraq had struck with the United Nations. It was also graft in the sense that it was skimmed away from money that was supposed to go for the relief of the Iraqi people. It went instead, as we know, for palaces, weapons, conventional but still deadly, and all the other things that Saddam Hussein liked to do with it. Um, when his government fell, in a sense, it, the same kind of thing happened as happened in the former Soviet Union. This corruption was, if, in a sense, privatized. It was no longer sort of the state. The state in, under Saddam was Saddam. So when he decided to have a collection for kickbacks, you, as the judge said, oil was for Saddam and his family.
that oil was the main source of, that was almost the so only source of foreign exchange for Iraq. Is it fair to say that what happened was that under Saddam Hussein, corruption was centralized and then when he was gone, it's like the head cut off and corruption spread much further to other, others who could be corrupt uh, independently? Um, it was spread even at that point in the sense that oil was for Saddam, but there's a huge evidence, documentary evidence that I have looked at and is publicly available from many of the investigations into the UN Oil for Food program, that the ministries, some of the ones that you're also concerned with, the Ministry for Sports, for, you know, for the, if, if you run through the list, the ministries, many of them which were involved in the humanitarian contracts, also had kickback deals. And so it was institutionalized there as well. What, what has been inherited by the Iraqis, by everyone who is dealing with this right now, the Americans, anybody, is a system in which really every, every part of the system, these were fractals, had something like this going on. Um, the evidence I have seen suggests that Saddam had a very, very, very organized way of raking in all the oil graph yeah. of the money. The rest of it was more difficult for him to control. In fact, in my written testimony, I mentioned the best report put out on the subject uh, in 2002, even before his fall, um, by the Coalition for International Justice, which talks about the Uday Kusei, remember them, Hussein rackets, and they were jockeying, sort of like you know the Sopranos of Iraq, uh, for who would control the turf, who had the cigarette. Do you, do you think that the fact that the corruption yeah. that we're seeing now in Iraq is making it harder for the Iraqi government to reconcile the different ethnic groups, the Shiites, the Sunnis, the Kurds, and do you think that uh, the corruption that's going on uh, now is making it more difficult for the Maliki government to have the legitimacy with the people of Iraq? I think that it would be a wonderful thing if the connections were that linear. Uh, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to think how to explain it because it's a more complex set of interactions well, Do you that think this on. is a, one of the factors that, uh, that uh, works against the goals of, uh, of reconciliation in Iraq and uh, legitimacy for the government? Oh, corruption is terrible in any setting, absolutely. Oh, and there's one other thing I meant to say to you. Mm -hmm. I uh, fully agree that it would be a highly useful thing were the State Department to be far more open. I would, if anything, suggest taking it back some years I think at this point there may be less ability to influence things that way than there was. On the other hand, what's the point? Of, you know, we go forward. Um, I think I think when we someone should go forward. But uh, the frustrations I share the frustration of trying to see documents that I think should be publicly available. Um, my own experience was. It took five years from the time I called someone at the U.S. mission in 2000, early 2003 to say, I see generic signs that in this debate over whether or not the U.S. should go into Iraq, the members of the Security Council have been bribed by Saddam Hussein because his graft also radiated out. You know, it affected everything that came close. That, that is, when Charles Delfer said in testimony, two years ago, it poisoned everything it touched. That was the system mm -hmm. that Saddam set up. Um, and uh, I think there was a moment when we first went in, this is my own, I'm giving my own view, sort of like the first day on a new job when you have a chance to do things, where bringing out what was at that point clear and yet very hard to document would have, might have helped, it might have said, you know, we won't put up with this while there was a chance to set some terms. That didn't happen. It took until the following year, 2004, when an Iraqi newspaper, Almada, published what we now know as the Almada List, of a whole long list of people on the take, simply on the oil side of the graft in the, that program that had become the Iraqi economy, basically. Isn't, the um, problem, isn't there a problem in Iraq in trying to figure out how to deal with the sharing of the oil revenues because it's so 
much a major part of their economy? That actually. Because I know our government has tried to push them to adopt legislation for greater sharing of those revenues so people could all feel they have a stake in the future of the country. I will give you again my own prescription and one I wrote in 2002, but many people wrote many things. Mm -hmm. um, I think they will have this problem. I, I would actually say part of the, <laughs> I think part of the problem, corruption is a symptom. Let me back up and try an economic, just an economic slant on this. Corruption is basically, uh, you know, what is it? What is a corrupt deal? There are many kinds of ways and levels in which you can engage in it. But basically, it's putting a price on a transaction. It's saying, you want something done? Okay, but I can get that done for you. I have discretionary power, but there's a price. It's a pricing mechanism for things that, you know, in a society with, more in with integrity ought to just happen. The government should do the things for you, not make you pay for. Um, and in that sense, the oil is one of the things that is, makes for immense corruption as long as it's in the public domain. My own recommendation actually has been from the beginning, unless it is privatized, I mean, the way it really should be dealt with is sell it off to private companies and distribute the revenues, the, with the, in, the, the whatever is raised by that to the people of Iraq. That would be the, the, what that does is it removes from the public domain that endless tempting pot, mm -hmm. which I actually think explains a great deal of the war that's going on mm -hmm. there right now. You know, we also we well, always that's, that's a very interesting point. I see my red yeah. light, so I'm going to sure. call on Mr. Davis to ask you a question. Well, thank you very much for your experience and insights on this. Um, Iraq right now is a fledging democracy in the middle of war. Uh, how do wartime circumstances uh, exacerbate uh, the corruption? Oh, they, well, in a normal economy, they would tend to make it worse because you would put on, the government would put on regulations and rationing, but Iraq hasn't had a normal economy uh, since, you know, in decades. Um, they never did, did they, really? I, 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 yeah, I think the problem of how are people choosing to spend their money this may sound odd, but I'm just, again, I'm sort of thinking like the economic view of this. And could I just suggest, we've heard a lot from the State Department today and from bureaucrats who use phrases like capacity building. I don't think anyone who uses the phrase capacity building is going to be able to think past that jargon to figure out what really needs to be done. Well, do you think um, the State Department's doing enough? Sorry? Do you think the State Department is doing enough? I think the they're doing, actually, I think they're doing the wrong things. Um, they're doing too much of what they shouldn't and not enough of what they should. And I think what they ought to be doing is, um, first of all, to whatever extent they can, looking for ways to reduce all these mechanisms that make it possible for people to collect graft. You know, what is it that people are selling when they collect graft, when corruption happens in Iraq? Uh, oil is one of the things that fuels it. That's what I was going to say. I think flip it around. As long as there is oil in the public domain, it will be extremely difficult to deal with corruption. You know, that's the reason if you look at the OPEC lineup, with the exception basically of Norway, they're enormously corrupt right. states. Well, that's because the democracies there have never had to face the contract between being taxed for services and getting the buy-in because the money's come too easily, basically, right? That's exactly right. And when you have to haggle out with people, with the people you're collecting the taxes from, you have a great deal more, you know, take take a country, I lived in India years ago, well, well, and just, uh, corruption just stop was it. So but basically, yeah, sure. the oil exacerbates the corruption. Yeah. It's done it in Russia. It's done it in Venezuela. It's done it in, where's that transparency list? It's, it's yeah. no accident, yeah. I mean, uh, in some well, So you were explaining what the, state de what the State Department ought to do differently. You were saying they're doing the wrong things. I'm going to say something that probably will sound crazy, but let's put it on the record. That's all right. You're the biggest favor, anyone could, so the biggest if favor if anyone could do to actually help end corruption in Iraq would be destroy their oil wells. Leave them like the people in Hong Kong who sat on a rock and thought, what can we do with ourselves? And or the people on Taiwan who ended up there, too many of them on an island and had to figure out ways to earn, li earn a living where 
there wasn't somebody doling it out or people fighting for this right. immense source of wealth. However, I understand the State Department probably isn't going to go bomb the oil no, as but of Iraq. That, so th that's, <laughs> that's a good observation. You know, the fastest growing economy, fastest growing Arab economy in the Middle East is Jordan, and they have no oil. Exactly. And that is no accident. Correct. It's the great curse. In fact, it's the same thing some of the most perceptive Russians said to me when I was working there. And that is one of the problems here. I in other words, we always it's such so tempting to talk about fighting corruption in terms of you know set up an agency do a study there are things that if we had privatized that oil when we first went in there and you know you can see the complications that there would be an outcry oh my god right. is that trying to steal it it would have been terribly important if there's ever any political way to do it i don't see really how you would but you're the politicians i i'm not i just say what i can see is if there were any way to do it the money should go to the people of Iraq. That's the patrimony yeah. that right now in theory they own, but in practice what they get for it is wars. Uh, you know, and um, it's, thing, it's looking for some way to deal with things like that that can actually help. I'm not, as I mentioned, I'm not familiar enough right now with the what are the nest of rules of claims of things that Iraqis have to bribe for. I'm much more familiar with what it was when Saddam Hussein was doing right. business. That was and quite Do you know how this operated under the British mandate? I mean, did you have the level of corruption? British usually ran a pretty yeah. clean uh, area. I mean, well, one of the things that they, that was much harder to buy under the British was any semblance of law. I mean, every, any system will have some corruption, but part of I saw it in, at work in Russia. Um, it's frustrating, it's heartbreaking, you can see what's needed, and it's extremely hard to bring into being. Thus, the, thus that answer of 50 years when Douglas North, he wasn't kidding. But back, back up for a minute. Look at the countries, look at what was going on in Europe just after World War II. Germany was a disaster. I mean, Graham Greene wrote wonderful novels about how corrupt things were in those times. That was the third man, Orson Welles selling tainted penicillin, you know, laming children so he could live well. Uh, the sort of symbol of the time. It, you know, it takes a long time. There's no, and I realize the question you've been asking at the hearing today is, is there, sign, is there a sign of hope? Um, I would suggest there is in the following sense. Under Saddam Hussein, there was no hope. It was built into the system in ways where as long as he and his circle were there, nothing could change. Now there is some hope, and there are some signs that I think matter. Uh, that Almada list I mentioned earlier, a Baghdad newspaper at least could print a list of the corrupt people. They can discuss it in a to a degree they could not. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you to yeah. hold that and recognize Mr. Van Hollen. He may sure. be pursuing these same yeah. lines of questions, but. Mr. Chairman, let me just thank our witness. I'm really, but thank you for being patient and thank you for uh, adding oh, your observations you. yes, to that. Absolutely. Mr. Van Hollen, do you have questions of the witness? Okay. I want to thank sure. the uh, witness, and I, I caught some of your testimony actually on the internal uh, uh, monitors uh, as you started off your testimony, and I think we can all agree that this is not a, a partisan issue in terms of the desire to fight corruption. That yeah. Republicans and Democrats alike would like to join uh, in that effort. Uh, and having been a journalist, I would assume that you think that publicizing or exposing corruption is one way to fight it. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, it's a pretty good way, yeah. No, no, I mean, we have a saying around here that sunlight is often the best disinfectant, meaning if you allow the public to watch what's going I, on. I usually call it daylight, but I write daylight. that, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I mean, you would agree with that general proposition, would you not? Yes, I would. Okay. So I find it very curious that the State Department has taken the position that even talking about corruption in Iraq uh, in open uh, is somehow a bad thing, because you would think one of the best tools we could use to try and clean it up and make sure that funds were better used would be to expose the problem in public. Wouldn't you agree? I would. I think they're making a mistake. Um, could I back up, though, and just say one thing I think is terribly important to put in context, yeah. and it is 
that um, they should have been doing it for years. There, again, it's what I was saying before. Uh, this this thing has deep roots, long legs, and has morphed as it's gone along. I'm not convinced that there is, from what I, the you know, the tangible signs one can see, that there is more corruption in Iraq than there was, say, during the final years under Saddam, because I think you need to ask the further question, corruption of what kind? But if, if what's I it could, buying? What's it doing? If I but just basically what I'm saying is, oh, yeah, I think, they should have been, I think they should have exposed the documentation they had on corruption under the UN Oil for Food program. I think they should have spilled out documents as soon as they went into Baghdad and began finding them. And yes, I do think that they should be producing more today. Right. I mean, obviously, this, the regime of Saddam Hussein was a, a terrible regime. It was a regime we, we did criticize openly in many, many different ways for lots of their actions. No, no, you have no idea. But, but the, frustra the frustrations that you are, have been experiencing, okay. right. I found in trying to get I documentation. Understand. But we, we, did, we did invade Iraq uh, with the government of Saddam Hussein. And now, of course, we yeah. are there. We had. The the, the interim government, uh, and we had the coalition authority. And uh, the fact of the matter is, we are now, wouldn't you agree, in a much better position, if we chose to, to affect the problem of corruption in Iraq than we were under the regime of Saddam Hussein. You would agree with that, would you not? Yes. Okay. What, so let me, so what, I guess uh -huh. that the question is why we have spent such a, a measly amount of money. Oh, wait, in no, terms actually, no, wait, can I back up? I think we would have been, I think it would have, no, I think it would have had actually an extremely salutary effect if we had been, if we, we, who's we, if the U.S. State Department, if the U.S. government had been, I'm not with the government, I'm a journalist, <laughs> if the U.S. government had been forthcoming at the time, had been open, had said, here are the documents showing what's going on, who's doing these deals, I think that would have actually possibly even headed off this war. Okay, that, that's, how, that's how important I think it was, but I agree it should happen now. I would link that to something very important. I think as an argument for saying let's leave, abandon Iraq, to me it doesn't, it doesn't hold up because what is it we're trying to achieve there? Um, you know, would it be then less corrupt if we left? I don't think so. I think, again, the judge put it very well. I think predatory neighbors would move in and it would be hell uh, beyond anything they're seeing now. Um, should America care about that? That's a subject for another hearing, I think. But, um, but, yeah, you, but you, would ag you would agree, and I, I, you would agree, would you not, that the failure of the State Department to sort of publicly address this issue makes it easier for it to continue. In other words, if you were to shine a light on this problem and publicly yeah. address the problem, you're more likely to be able to solve and confront the problem, isn't yes, that the case? Yes, I agree. I can see a case for hiving off what is probably the 2 or 3 percent of whatever the actual documentation or evidence is that does, in fact, involve mortal danger to somebody. I'm all for that. But the other 80 or 90 percent or so, yeah, put it out there. I, I, I think that's, I think there's over and over again, we see with diplomatic institutions, I see this all the time, my main focus in recent years has been the United Nations, but the State Department is in some way akin to this, this, that kind of thing. We see the argument that we can't rock the boat. You mustn't shake people up. We don't want to disturb anything. Um, very often people are not fools. Uh, you know, Iraqis know if they're corrupt, there's corruption. It has real effects. It's better to say, here is the problem. Mm -hmm. And if that needs, if, if that needs to be accompanied for purposes of U.S. politics or security by the argument that it is terribly important that we be able to sustain a government in Iraq one way or another, fine. But yeah, better to tell the truth. Is Could it safe I to say that if the State Department won't talk in an open forum about corruption in Iraq, the people in Iraq are still going to know whether there's corruption in Iraq? Of course. Uh, they will not know that it was in a, the that same was way. A, a rhetorical question. Let yeah. me just close, and I think, I think that also raises the question about why they won't talk about it. People in Iraq know. 
Why they won't talk about it in open forum here, uh, I think, frankly, is an attempt to hide a very real problem going on in Iraq from the American people. The American thank you people. very much, Mr. From Chairman. From the American people, not the Iraqi people. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for having this hearing, and thank you for the witnesses that you uh, have asked to step forward. Uh, one of the advantages of missing your testimony, which you summarized, is I actually read your whole testimony, and uh, it's pretty stunning. Uh, because what you basically say is that Iraq has been a corrupt country for any number of years, but it had a unique kind of corruption because it was, it was using the apparatus of government under Saddam to become even more corrupt. That's and right. that the oil for food program, which, by the way, our committee exposed, we led the charge on, and you were a witness and a wonderful witness, um, the oil for food program institutionalized the corruption in a very public way within uh, yeah. uh, Iraq. Um, where, where I might disagree with uh, Mr. Van Hollen and, 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 and my very distinguished and sincere chairman is that um, I believe that Iraq is, the government is thoroughly corrupt uh, based on what it has been. And I believe in part it's corrupt because there are some in the government who if they thought it would be a government that would last uh, and yes. so on, that they would be more willing to invest uh, and say, okay, I'll make money in the long run through a um, less corrupt way. But if they think they, uh, that we're going to pull the rug out from under them, some are just going to cash in on a government they think is going to fall. And that's, I'll say parenthetically, one of the reasons why I think we need a timeline to tell those who think we're going to pull the rug out from under them, we're not, and to tell those who think we're going to stay forever, uh, that we're not going to stay forever in the way that we're now. That's an editorial comment. What I'd like you to comment on is um, just explain in your words how the oil for food program uh, has created almost a unique form of, of corruptness within a government. Sure. Uh, what it did was where, as you heard, the judge say, Saddam had sort of taken all oil for himself and his sons and his immediate cronies. Um, this made it into, this made it an internationally approved system in which basically he was handed all rights to dispose of all the oil to conclude all deals. And uh, this was under UN sanctions. It was a truly poisonous mix, in other words. Iraq was enormously corrupt from what one can read before. So what he did is he imposed, undersold his oil and got kickbacks. Yeah. And he overpaid for commodities and got kickbacks. Yes. And anyone who did business with him was doing business with the government, which they knew was corrupt. Yeah. And what he did, what happened was, you need to understand the UN, the UN oil for food program. Let me just, in very brief. You no, know, I, I, you need to be short because yeah. we, I only have three minutes left here, so give okay. the short version. Basically, uh, any money he could skim out of these oil flows, which were meant to buy relief for people in Iraq, was his to do whatever he wanted with. And this produced enormous incentives to, in every way possible, set up clandestine channels, front companies. Uh, this created a pool of talent, the same way in Afghanistan. You so had the people, people that were fight. he couldn't do it by himself. He had to engage his citizens in this effort. He had an entire bureaucracy, and that was this Iraqi who was brought over as a witness for the prosecution. So rather than teaching a government to be honest, he was basically you were getting an education under his government how to work for the state and be corrupt. That's exactly right. Okay. So um, I'm at this point. Uh, I go to Iraq a lot and I meet a lot of people, some who I think are trying to make it a better place, some mm -hmm. who I think are trying to make it a better place and skim money off of it. If in fact a particular leader or a number of leaders are corrupt, what is the value in the State Department? Let's just say Maliki. What, what would be the value and how would it help us work with Maliki to say that he is in fact corrupt? How, do, wh what, what, how is that going to make our troops safer? And how is that going to make us ultimately help change Iraq? I, uh, I'm not sure that we need to pronounce him corrupt. I think that uh, I'm speaking as a journalist here. This is how I, <laughs> I'll just tell you how I, I, I think that documentation speaks. I mean, it's not necessarily the job of the United States. It's the job of Iraqis. 
Have you met uh, anyone who thinks Iraq isn't corrupt? No. Everyone knows Iraq is corrupt, so we know it. So really the issue is, wh wh what do we do to make it less corrupt? Mm -hmm. That should be our goal. I know it's the goal of the chairman. The question is, how do we do that? Is exposing every leader that we think is corrupt going to make it less corrupt is my question. I don't, uh, I. Bottom line is we don't know. Yeah, you know what I think? I think that it does matter to actually see when, the, pro the, 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 the danger here is that you can start selectively targeting people. Okay. Who do you want to pick Let me, off? My, my I, I think it's not necessarily, you know, I can't, I'm not going to make policy. Okay, here's, a, here's here, the answer that I would have yeah. given, and tell me how you react, and thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, for letting me run over here. Uh, what it seems to me is when we see a corrupt act, yeah. When we see a payoff, when we see this, we expose the act yeah. and then let people go to see who performed the act. And it would seem to me that that should be our emphasis. Where, where do we identify a specific action of corruption? And I do agree, Mr. Chairman, with this point. I totally agree with it. If we have a witness that says Mr. Maliki or someone else, and he was under oath, I believe, all witnesses yeah, before is under oath under. is saying to us that a specific person uh, basically told me if I did this, my life would be in danger. Now, if he's saying that someone else is going to make your life in danger, that's one thing. But if he's saying, I'm going to make sure your life's in danger, I think that needs to be exposed. I do uh, totally agree would with the that. the gentleman mm -hmm. yield to me? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I asked Judge Roddy, do you think that Prime Minister Maliki is corrupt? And he said to me, I'm a judge. I can't make a, a decision on a point like that. I, I, I can't say that. But what I, he said, what I do know is that he stopped investigations of corruption of some of his relatives. Yeah. And, and if I could, um, uh, and that I think is the key point. It's, it's, it's kind of what I'm learning from this. The way he said it is the way I think we ultimately get at it because he is basically stating fact and action to which we then can respond. Which is the basis of law, actually. Yeah. That, that's, I mean, that which I think ultimately is what one, is what is needed here. I what Iraq is desperately missing. Do you want to summarize, Mr. No, Chairman? No. I, well, just to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. Uh, I thought your st statement was excellent because it, the one thing it's done for me is it's made me realize that there have been corruptions in lots of governments. But what's unique about this is under Saddam, he was actually teaching his, his citizens to be corrupt so that he could have the power he needed. And, and that was quite uh, May I just share with you for a second a well, vision? Well, we, we, we've been here all day, yeah. and uh, we've got a short business meeting we have to sure. attend to. So maybe you can get together with Mr. Shays after the, um, after the official meeting. And anything you want to put on the record in writing, yes, we, 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 could, should, we could submit. We'd certainly be This is one scene it. from a New York courtroom. It was simply the silver laptop. I wrote an article about it in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. You can read it. But the silver laptop on which the entire kickback database for the Iraqi oil ministry under Oil for Food had been downloaded, this database. And this Iraqi on the witness stand brought in by federal prosecutors to show the jury how it worked, typing in a name. And up would come the whole list of itemized kickbacks and connected front companies. And I have followed these documents for years at this point, mm -hmm. I had never understood quite that viscerally until I saw this, how thoroughly institutionalized it was. It was the way- You're talking about it, at, in the oil for food program yes. or today? No, this was the oil for food oh. program, but this was okay, well, Saddam Hussein's I government. I think people learned some lessons from that. Thank yeah. you very much. I, I, Thank I'm, you. I, I appreciate that story. and. Um, and uh, that, that uh, concludes our hearing for today, so we stand adjourned. Now we have a, a, a brief business meeting before us, and uh, I ask unanimous, unanimous consent that the committee consider and block and favorably report the postal naming measures and six resolutions described in a statement uh, that I will submit for the record. The bill numbers are H.R. 3572-H Conres 205-H Res 588-H Res 630-H Res 654-H Res 687 as amended and H. Res 697. 697 or 687? Uh, 687. Okay. And, hmm, as amended oh, yeah. and H. Res 697. Okay. 
and I think these have been uh, reviewed by both the Democrats and the Republican staff, and I know of no objection. So, it, uh, could you recognize me? Just finish. I'll just, gentlemen, wish yeah. to say Thank something. you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have reviewed the resolutions and, and um, postal namings and find that they meet the standards for our committee, and I, and I would just ask you, did you read, I interrupted you, and I may have, I, uh, did you read uh, Senate Bill 1896? No, that was taken off. I, I that was taken discussed off. that with Mr. Davis earlier. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Without objection, uh, that will be the order unanimous consent is given to uh, the postal naming bills. The uh, business meeting now stands adjourned. Thank you. Never by itself, by itself. Sunday, on C-SPAN's Road to the White House, the Republican presidential candidates on Iraq, part two in a series that featured Democrats.